Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 208, Damage Control. How to keep your board games in good shape. I'm Sean, your host, and we're here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern normally, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're talking about keeping your board games in good shape, what you can do to protect your games. After that, we've got two reviews, or rather one review and one preview. The review is for the Thrills and Chills expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, and the preview is for the latest Valeria game, which isn't even out yet, it's coming soon to Kickstarter next month. That is called Castellans of Valeria. We're then going to wrap up with a busy week in review as both of us got games in, some together and some apart, over the last couple of weeks. For links to all of the various games and other things we mentioned during the show, be sure to check out our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 208. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. Let's start with our topic of games we keep for others. Phil Hatfield writes, I've got a number of games I keep just to have around to introduce new players or to players who may be extremely limited in playing games. Many that you list are on that list, but I'll also add Takenoko. Yeah, Takenoko is a good call there. Uh, It's not the lightest game, but because of the awesomely cute pieces, the panda, the gardener, the nice chunky wooden bamboo, it makes the game seem very approachable, and I found it's great to get people who are generally scared of hobby board games to give this one a chance. And it's kind of like the difficulty sneaks up on them so they don't notice it. And they're like, oh, this isn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. But look at the cute panda. Uh, next, we have Xanth, who says, I do public play events, and I keep a bunch of games to play with the public. Below are a few. I, I do like all these games, but if it's my choice, I play something other than these. Mm-hmm. Yahtzee Free For All, King Domino, Duro, Quirkel, Naya, Forbidden Island, Suspend, and Strike. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I said when we were doing the actual episode that most of the games I keep are to host at public play events. Uh, speaking of which, if you're listening live and you happen to be in the Windsor, Ontario area, we are hosting one this Saturday at the Barbershop Bar, and I'll be bringing some of those games on our list. Now, Forbidden Island is one that was mentioned here that I think I might bring on Saturday that probably should have been on our list. Um, That one started off as something I had for my girls, but my girls got tired of it. But it's still a great intro co-op game that doesn't happen to be about a horrible thing that's actually happening in the world right now. Next, we've got Ron Frazier on the same topic with, as Sean said, I have some compromise games, but they're for my wife and kids. I say the first thing about that that I like is the term compromise games. I actually just like that. Like you'd have the shelf of compromise where you have like all the games that you keep and you kind of don't like them, but you keep them for some reason. I dig that term. And I guess that does make sense, right? Um, The one I think of now is Splendor. I was keeping that for Deanna, but now I keep it more so for Gwen who likes to bring it to school. All right. Well, let's wrap up with a comment from Weird who contacted Mo on Facebook to ask, quick question, because I'm on mobile and navigating the internet on my phone is a pain. But do you have like a master list of board games you've reviewed. I'll check when I get home anyways, so it's not a huge deal, just something I'm curious about. So I wanted to call this one out because at the time, the question, uh, the answer was no. No, we don't. We don't have a master list of games. We didn't have a list of reviews, except, oh, I technically, I have an Excel spreadsheet, but I didn't have anything online. And the thing is, I... I'm like, why, why don't we wait? That's, that's probably a good thing. That's something people probably care about. Um, both for people looking to see if we've reviewed a game without having to Google search for it. Plus just for publishers or whoever else to go look at all the stuff we've reviewed. So what happened is over the last couple of days, Deanna actually put together such a list, which you can now find over on the blog in our about section at the top of the page, a little drop down says about click on that. And it'll say everything we reviewed. And I got to say, thanks for the comment, Weird, because uh, it worked out to be a pretty useful inadvertent suggestion that we've already acted on. Well, thanks, everyone, for your comments, replies, and feedback. We love hearing from you, even if we don't read every comment out during the show. 
So now it's time for us to stop in the lobby and say hi to the awesome folk who have joined us live here on Twitch. Now, this segment does get cut from the full podcast, though we do include it with our patron-only bonus audio each week. So the best way to hear it is just be here live when we record mostly on Wednesday nights. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Now, tonight's question comes from Carlos L., who writes, I just discovered the podcast about a month ago, and so far, I'm a quarter of the way through your archive. That's... I don't know if I can go through our archive. (laughs) Work backwards. At least then you got to hear the good stuff first. (laughs) All right. I have quickly become a fan of the show, and I really appreciate the wealth of knowledge that you both bring to the tabletop community. I'm going to say that's a little bit more towards Mo on that one, but I just try and organize it a little bit. Now, I'm a stay-at-home dad with my wife and two young girls, and while I'm a burgeoning fan of hobby games, I can't quite say that I've managed to get the rest of my family on board yet. But that's for another day. How to rook your family into gaming. Tune in next episode. No, no. My question for you is this. What do you think are some of the best tips for protecting your games and keeping them in good condition? Of course, games are fundamentally meant to be played. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'd like to take good care of them so that, hopefully, one day when my family comes around, they'll still be in good shape for all of us to enjoy. I've heard lots of debate about if boxes should be shelved horizontally or vertically, how many boxes can be safely stacked upon one another, if cards should be sleeved, how to shuffle cards without bending them, silica gel packets, and the like. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Carlos, for the great question. I love these long-form questions. These are my favorite ones to get, right? Like our goal here at Tabletop Bellhops to be a Dear Abbey for gamers. I love getting the Dear Abbey long kind of explains where they are and not just hey tell me about good trick taking games definitely appreciate that so thank you for that um it seems you've already done some research and i i think it's kind of cool you're kind of looking to us to say like what do you guys think because i've read all these different opinions so i i appreciate your uh faith in us to give you the right answer though this one will be a bit interesting because sean and i are kind of on different sides of the fence for this whole thing and the big thing i will be talking about though is options not necessarily options we have chosen to use. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. And a lot of it is going to depend on what sort of collector you are, or uh, if you go back a few episodes, where in your uh, board game path, life path, are yeah. you? Um, if you are into the collecting and the, and you know, if you are thinking about future value, uh, or even this, you know, passing on to future mm-hmm. generations, you may want to think about things a little bit more uh, stiffly than if you are just out to buy some games and play them and enjoy them. Yep. Uh, and what happens happens. Now, another thing you should be looking at is how often your games get played. It's going to matter a lot more if you play your games at public play events where anyone from the public come in and grab your game and set up in a corner and you got 200 possible people there, all who could be sharing and talking and reboxing and tossing things around and you can't watch everyone how they take care of your game versus you've got your own game group. You've got 50 games and you play maybe this one, one week, this one, another, you've got games you played 10 times and yeah, there's that shelf over there with games you haven't played yet, which I think is more the average gamer nowadays, the average hobby gamer. The more you use your games and the more use they're going to see, the more you might want to consider protecting your games. Absolutely. And it also depends on how they get used. Uh, For instance, uh, a game like The Game of Life, where the only thing that's really happening, you know, the money gets used and the little peg figures and cars get used, but the rest of it is kind of mostly on display or or used once or twice Mm -hmm. during the game versus a magic deck, which is going to get some pretty heavy use every time you're playing that game. Man, the the shape my magic cards were in when I sold them was kind of disgusting. <laughs> and yeah, this the was edges. a thing the, the 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 black schmutz that would gather on the corners of your cards so that your white bordered cards eventually turned into black border cards is kind of disturbing. And I, I think that was a bit of the ink coming off on your fingers and it just old magic cards. I don't know if that was something they ever improved or just everyone sleeves, but like I'm not a sleever. And looking at that now, I was just like, oh my God, my cards were in bad shape. So Let's start talking about some things you can do. Again, 
do this as seriously as you think you need to. I, I, we don't have hard set rules. This is what you must do to keep your game in great position. Here's what you knew, must do to keep it near mint. That's not what this is going to be tonight. This is going to be a back and forth between Sean and I talking about various ways to protect games. It's up to you to decide which are ridiculous and which aren't. And then what I'd love to hear is comment. Comment down below. Send us feedback. Direct message us. And tell us what worked for you. That, that I think, is going to be a more fun conversation after the fact than possibly what we're talking about here. I mean, and to be clear, uh, right up front, neither one of us are, you know, those mint inbox collectors of games. Correct. We play our games. And yep. we, we, you know, we... That we, said, uh, I do try it. to keep mine in good condition, but that's just something I have had since I was a child where, you know, I still had the original box for my Millennium Falcon and the instructions because they belong there. Um, I was undiagnosed with anything, but I, there, there's enough things out there that I'm like, yeah, I think that might be me, um, in, in the obsessiveness I had with my toys and collections and keeping things together. Sadly, my kids do not have that. So when I bring looping Louie to the barbershop bar, everyone will only have two chickens each instead of three. <laughs> so moving on to the first one, I want to talk stacking a bit. Okay. Cause this is huge. This is, this is, it, it's. It's the which edition of D&D &D is better argument of board gaming. Should you store your games horizontal or vertical? The big thing here is to me, horizontal is better for the components. Vertical is better for the box. And to me, what would you rather protect? If you want your box to look shiny, yeah, put it this way. Because you're not going to get bowing. You're not going to stock things on top. Your corners aren't going to get rubbed. You're not going to catch the clips on the edges of your bookshelves. And your box is going to look pristine. But your components are very likely, even with a box insert, going to dump all over the place when you store vertically. And literally over time, now this takes a lot of time, boards can warp due to being held up this way. It's very unlikely. Most of the games you play, you're not going to play for enough years to have that happen. That's like you kept it up in your attic for a while type of problem. So it doesn't affect the average gamer. And yeah. many vertical boxers will say it never happens. I'm like, no, it just takes like, like years, 20, 30 years. It's, it's not going to happen in a few months. It's not going to happen in probably the lifetime of the game. So it's totally up to you which way you want to do it. But to me, if you are trying to keep your components organized and not rubbing into each other and not bouncing around, you're better horizontal. Now, one of the things that will make a big difference here is the board games you have. Because a, a standard hobby board game, which is that more, more cube square-ish, mm -hmm. um, is able to stand vertically Whereas a, your old coffin box, the old Mattel boards, you know, your monopolies and things like that. Yeah, those are not They designed. are not at all designed to be stored vertically. And so it's not even really an option if you are going with more of the mass market coffin yeah. style boxes. Well, I'll admit I have seen a gamer shelf where it was, you know, sorry, or cheesy, whatever, all mm. stood up this way. I not, would not this wanna... way. I've yet to see this, but this way. I would still not want to actually open that box and try and get it set up. Yeah. Well, in most of those boxes, though, your cleanup method was into yeah. the box. So at that point, it doesn't matter much. So again, I'm not going to get into any more detail about stacking, except to give you a few extra tips. Now, if you are concerned about things getting damaged, one of the things you can do if you is when you open your game, and we said this one a few times, I mentioned a lot on our unboxing videos, a pro tip that a lot of people don't know is once you punch the punch boards out, in most games, if you then put them under the insert, it then closes that gap because otherwise if you throw the cardboard out, you'll have the gap for how thick the cardboard was by putting it underneath that should make it now flush with the top. So even for those of you storing vertically, that may keep your components in place. Do be I aware, still find though, that's a 50, yeah. 50 proposition. Do be aware though. I have seen more board games you've unboxed recently where the box lid doesn't close yes. in the shipping mode and it's designed to get to throw out the punch boards. Yes. So pay attention when you're first unboxing if the box if it sticks closes up closes or not. Yeah, basically, if that's the case, but put punch boards underneath till it works. Like <laughs> put, put put them all and be like, oh, sticks up, take one out, try again. That, that's a tip I wish I had known years ago. And I do it for all of my games. And it does make a difference. Now, even better is if you somehow have a way to hold that box lid on tight which gets into using um, elastics. Now, in general, you don't want to use elastic, like your standard tight elastic. Rubber, you don't rubber use elastics, the sort of things you use uh, in the office for elastics, the brown rubber, or even even the green and blue rubber ones that are, that are thicker and wider. 
please don't. Those are no, not good don't. for those are not good for paper products in general. Yes. Yeah. What you want is is there are things called box bands that are specifically made to hold boxes. There's another one called box tape where it's it's um, tape that sticks to itself. So you just wrap it around the edge and it sticks to itself. Uh, you can even use paper strips. Um, bows. I saw someone using bows and I'm like, that's kind of brilliant in a way, but using, using ribbon to do it is better than elastic, but that's a way to keep them closed. Now, going back to tips for horizontal, if you are worried about stuff getting scuffed, put paper between the boxes. It also is a bonus. It's going to make it easier to slide your games apart. You don't have to grab the entire stack. So it's, it's, it's a two way street on this one. You're, you're getting two things out of it. But you need some kind of contact paper to put between every box. And you got to not be lazy when you take it out and let the paper fall on the floor. And I'll pick it up later. And then you just end up with this mess all over your game room. Absolutely. That one's probably going a little excessive for most people. But yeah. if you really are worried, it is certainly a strong way to go. Just make sure you are using an acid-free paper so mm -hmm. that you are not leaching uh, any of the color or anything out of the boxes if yep. they're sitting there for a long time. Now, recently on Kickstarter, there's been a few of these is separators to put in your shelves. Now, these tend to be designed for the IKEA Kallax shelf, which is what almost every gamer seems to have. You can see one of them behind me, but that's not actually where I usually store my games. That's just to make a pretty backdrop for our podcast. Most of my shelves look like the one on the left, which is just a bunch of games on a bookshelf. Um, one of the things, if you're buying those, make sure you get thick enough shelves so they don't bow. But there are now these things that you basically, uh, they're, they're, they're cubby organizers. They're, they're like the kind of things people have been buying for their closets for years. Someone has realized, hey, we can make these for board games. In particular, a recent one featured little shelves with little rollers on them. And the, your games would literally slide in and out. So you're getting to keep them horizontally, but actually separated from each other and on a roller system so there's no rubbing and they come easily out. Now, these are ridiculously expensive and they, and they take up room. <laughs> They, they are wasting, you're wasting a bunch of space inside your Calax. Yes. So, so Calax does tend to have some give, like the standard Calax box still gives you about an inch on every side to get your stuff out. So you're not wasting it that way, but the up and down is you're, you're adding about, you know, whatever, I don't know, quarter of an inch to an inch on top of every box. But again, that to me is over the top, but if you're really worried about protecting your games, that might be worth it. Absolutely. Now, again, one thing to keep in mind here is, the box is not the game. Your box mm -hmm. can go through a vast amount of beating and damage and things. And as long as it still manages to keep everything inside in nice, neat order, you're still able to play that game however long later. Yep. Yes, I, I find most of the average hobby gamers a little too obsessed over the quality of their box. Now, once you get inside the box this might become more important. Yeah. Now, the next big debate is to sleeve or not to sleeve. I, I would say the average, from what I've seen, now seems to be on the side to sleeve. It seems like most gamers sleeve their games, uh, going to the trouble of finding specific sleeves for specific games with specific card sizes. I am not a sleever. I don't like the feel of sleeve cards. I hate the way they stack and fall over, and I hate shuffling them. Plus, I don't like I bring my some of my games to public play events and I will admit I have sleeved a couple games. But if you look at how often the cards are used and touched, that's how I make the decision. So I sleeved Star Realms because Star Realms for a while was getting played at every event multiple times. I kept my deck in my pocket. My wife and I play at coffee shops. I was playing a lot of Star Realms and that is another heavy shuffling dueling card game where you're constantly touching and sh shuffling the cards. We are also considering sleeving Aventuria, potentially, because of how often we expect to play it, especially the character decks, because we don't want those to wear out. In general, though, uh, unless you're playing something like Magic with that heavy replay and lots of shuffling constantly, we sometimes multiple times a week, cards are made to be used. Uh, <laughs> and, and sleeving is an expense. Um, it yeah. is... A, Often a, more than the cost hitch. of the game. Yeah. Now, one time, now one benefit, the real benefit to sleeving is every once in a while, you'll get games where the expansions come out and all of a sudden the card backs have changed just a little bit or the sizing or of lot. the card or, the, or a lot or the sizing of the card has changed, changed just a bit. And you don't want that 
whole the, the 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 ability to you know look at the back of somebody's hands and go oh well they've got something from that yeah from that expansion and that expansion and that expansion that means i better do this mm -hmm. uh, and in that case some of the custom backed sleeves can be a huge benefit yep. but that's not protecting your game that's making up for a mess up on yeah. behalf of the publisher yeah, and honestly, another another aspect of that, again, not protecting your game is to be able to tell your cards apart from someone else's, especially in games where you have to pass cards to other players or whatever. If you've got your own sleeves, you know, those are your cards. So, yeah, sleeving debate, I go for it. If, if you are at all concerned, this is probably the number one thing that's going to protect your card games the most. If you double sleeve, especially, which to me is going a little too far, you tend to even get waterproofing almost. You can deal with spills. Sleeving also has the benefit if you can you can wash them, you can clean them as they, as they get mucky. Uh, sleeving really does make some sense to me. It just it's the added expense and the amount of time spent doing it to me is just not worth it. I know I'm completely on the same page there. And Next then uh, interestingly, Darkling Blight in the chat says they find sleeved cards easier to shuffle. See, I find them harder. Now I do know there's like all kinds of YouTube videos on how to how to shuffle sleeve cards, but yeah. So sleeving is a big one. Um, sleeving and stacking. Pick how you're going to stack your cards. Pick how you're going to sleeve them. To me, those are kind of like like the the bare minimum. Like like those. That's your bare minimum protection. Is is store your games in a way they're not going to get damaged and sleeve them to protect the components. Now the rest of this to me is going a little bit more above and beyond, which you may or may not want to do. So next up, we've got uh, a bunch of different box options. So you can protect your box. But maybe that box that you got with the game isn't the right solution at all. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's better to find a new box. We've talked, if you, if you watch any of our unboxings, Bo will almost always call out if the box is, you know, air. Uh, mostly air or if it's only got the trough insert, which will get it to you safely. But as soon as you, you know, unwrap your cards and unpunch the deck or un unpunch the cards, it's completely useless for keeping everything safe and neat and separated. Right. Yeah. And reboxing is a thing. Um, a great example of this and, and Owen's in our chat. So he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Cause that's the first time I saw it is there are a number of people who had had the brilliant idea. I don't know who started it to buy photo boxes, which are these plastic cases with little tiny individual cases where you put your family photos or whatever in it and you label each one. These are fantastic. For transporting a high number of small portable games in one place that also end up like if you buy the good ones, like they're waterproof and everything else. And you can like bring them on the boat without having to worry that, you know, your game falls into the lake. Like, yeah, now once you're out playing, you got to be a little mm -hmm. careful. But the, the, the concept of this is awesome. And I've seen other people do. I have seen people who rebox their board games into a, a manila envelope style drawer and every game's in a Ziploc bag and they're just tagged. And because all they need is the components. The other option that I've seen done a lot uh, and this is a sort of a hobby of its own is reboxing into just smaller boxes. So when you mm -hmm. look at the box and, and we talk about how much empty air, air is in it, well, they take that. Out. So if it's, you know, the, the boxes all of a sudden are half the size of the original and you can fit more onto a shelf and you can pack them more snugly and, and mm -hmm. more efficiently into a, uh, into your shelving units. And, and again, that can actually protect things because there's less so not, room for things to move around inside yep. your box. No, exactly. Um, another thing, too, with this is if you are the collector type, you can't have to throw out the old box. You could. I, I have seen this once and I thought it was kind of brilliant. And it, to me, it reminded me of something I'd seen at the local library is the person had the shelf of games behind them. The, the Calax with the square boxes with some stacked this way, some stacked this way, and some just like showing it off. But then when you actually asked to play the game, they went over to a different area of their house in a closet and pulled out drawers and pulled out the components in cardboard pizza boxes because the cardboard pizza boxes all fit everything better. And I'm like, wow, like, like they still have their display, right? They have their, oh, look at my collection. They have their hoard and their hoards in mint condition. If they ever go to sell these games, they just have to put the stuff back in the original box and it'll look great. But they get the added bonus of not ever possibly damaging it because it's stored separately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then the other option, of course, is what happens when your game outgrows its box. Yeah. Uh, and you can see uh, just behind me there, there's my original multiverse box. 
Uh, and then just out of the camera sight is the new multiverse box that I have upgraded to. Uh, so I've actually upgraded my my box, my big box expansion to a new big box Bigger expansion. box expansion. And, and in theory, we've already realized that it's not quite big enough and it could use to be a little bigger still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, another so, example of this is uh, the, a good one is Space Base. Space Base put out the command station, which they were nice to give you some extra stuff that literally is about protecting your game because it gives you a place to store all the Space Base stuff that's out, including all of the expansions, including even the most recent one, to fit in there. But it also gave you sleeves for Space Base cards, which are very hard to find because Space Base cards are like cards divided in half or a third. I'm not even sure. They're long, skinny cards. And it gave you a box insert that holds everything in its place. And I'm like, that is fantastic. Um, another example of this that's not quite as nice, but when we got Core Worlds and then Galactic Orders came out, Core Worlds won't fit Galactic Orders, but Galactic Orders will fit Core Worlds. So the expansion came in a larger box in order to fit the base game, which is kind of backwards, but I thought it was a nice way to do it. Absolutely. And then uh, other, uh, other solutions, sometimes like the multiverse, they just put out a box uh there there were a, there was a small card set with it but for the size of the box you get you get a small deck of cards yeah but the ability to hold a huge deck uh or collection of decks and the other games have done this like smash up for instance mm -hmm. which has at least one if not two uh big yeah the big geeky boxes, box big geeky box uh, and these also often come with extra dividers or fancier dividers to mm -hmm. keep things all neat and organized, which again, keeping things neat and organized helps longevity because you don't yes. have to mess around with things to find and hunt and peck as much. Now, the next one I have is right above my head here. For those that can see it on the show is gamer luggage, carrying cases, ways to move your stuff around. So what's right above me is my quiver from quiver time. Uh, we haven't talked about them in a long time, but we actually, we, they were a sponsor of the show for a while. We did a review of the quiver. Look up my quiver review. I love this piece of gamer luggage. It is specifically designed for card games, but it has movable pouches. It's got um, like a fishnet thing at the top for instructions or tokens. And I know people who bring, I think someone, the record I saw was something like 32 different games in their quiver. Now, a bunch of those were the like 18 card love letter style games, but still my current quiver is still packed from, um, oh, what con did we go to? Breakout con. And I think I've got seven games in there. I, I've got my, my Keyforge decks, just in case someone wants to play Keyforge. I've got um, Sentinel Comics, I think, is in there. And I got a bunch of other stuff because it let me put it all in one place. But like, not only is it a good way to transport my game, it everything's snug, nothing's sliding around. And with that, I'm also using the plastic deck boxes, which you can also see over my shoulder. So I put the cards are sleeved in a deck box in a quiver. Those cards are not getting damaged. Yeah, and my quiver has, uh, it's not actually on display right now, but it's got uh, a bunch of decks of, also of, um, um, uh, game Keyforge? Keyforge, Keyforge decks, but it's all, I've also got a wrestling uh, board game, a wrestling card game, but uh, go. I've got several teams and, and, and uh, sort of uh, tag teams and, and, and wrestlers all sorted out in that with tokens and dice. Uh, it's it's just a fantastic way to do things. Uh, unfortunately, it's nowhere near big enough to hold DC deck building. You'd need uh, not all at once. You'd need <laughs> two, maybe three quivers to hold uh, the same as the multiverse box. You need a quiver of quivers and and a, and a much more padded shoulder strap too. It's yes. <laughs> and and there are other of these. Like uh, Sean and I were just looking at a a fantastic look like a piece of suitcase luggage that you would unzip for card games. And I was like, oh, that would be perfect for bringing a Venturia somewhere. Yeah. Now, I even have, and again, you, it's over my shoulder there. There's a wooden box there. It's a card box that currently has my Aventuria stuff in it. But to go with that, down under that is a binder. That is a great way to protect your cards if it's a game where you're going to pick through the cards. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're not going to just bring, bring a deck, you need to flip through and grab cards. Binders are great for that. I think anyone who's collected sports cards knows what I'm talking about. Um, and many, again, Magic Pokemon players also use these. If so you're doing that deck construction way. prior to the game, to the event, it's a great way to, you know, flip yeah. through and go, oh, I need one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. Yeah. Or any card game where you're like picking a character and there's like sets of character cards that go with them. There's a lot of adventure games. I could even see it for like Gloomhaven, though. Gloomhaven comes with nice little boxes. Yeah. 
All right, enough about cards and boxes. Let's move on to the other components in your game. And I'm going to move on to tokens or chits or whatever else you want to call counters is another one. And this is a brilliant one I have not personally used, but I know people who have done. And that is using coin capsules. Coin capsules are little plastic things for holding coins. Coin collectors use them. You can get these dirt cheap pretty much anywhere online, your usual online game stores. Uh, sorry, online mass market stores. I have never seen these in a game store, though, which maybe that's a game store should get in on this. Um, you buy them and then you put your tokens in them. Um, first time I saw this done was for the game Above and Below and their little round tokens. The next time I saw it done, it was for Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is a brilliant way to make those tokens. All, they all still feel the same, but protects them. Because I got to say, Quacks is one. The more you shuffle around that cardboard, the more it's getting beat up every time you play it. That is one that, that definitely is something to to worry about, which we'll get to, a, in my opinion, better way to protect that game in a minute. But coin capsules can be used for anything. I've seen historic war gamers using coin capsules for their square tokens. So it's They come in various sizes. Um, there are other, I will just call them collector's capsules, you can also look up besides just coins, but coins is the easiest one to find. Yeah, and I mean, you're looking at uh, at 200 for under $30 Canadian. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very... Uh a cost efficient way to do it if you've got uh you know the right number of components that are the right size for what you can find available uh so that's a way to protect your your tokens and stuff but then there's the board itself there are a number of people the first time i ever heard of this was snakes and lattes which was uh canada's first big um board game cafe and they kind of started the trend of board game cafes where they varnish all of their boards they have spray varnish in general, you want a matte varnish, unless the board is already glossy, then you might want a gloss varnish. Uh, for best protection, you want to hit it with gloss varnish, then matte varnish. The thing is, some varnishes don't work well with some dyes, and some varnishes will yellow over time. Now, I wish I could point you to a specific one, because we have been asked to review one multiple times, and I don't know what's happened where it keeps falling through, where it hasn't shown up, and I have to write them. And But there is now a company that makes board game varnish. Um, personally, I recommend testers dull coat, but if you can, anytime you're going to varnish anything, try it first. So if you are varnishing specifically tokens or components, pretty much every punch board comes with one or two extra blank bits. Try it on those. If you have to do a bit of the punch board itself that has color on it uh, for okay. a board, do a corner, do a small corner, see how it sits, let it, let it go a week at least, and then decide if you want to do the whole board. Apparently, uh, Krylon UV resistant matte finish is what yeah. Snakes and Lattes actually used. There you go. So, you, like Snakes and Lattes, those games are played by hundreds of people. They are one of the most popular board cafe game cafes in the world. Uh, one so, thing to note, though, if you are doing a spray treatment like this, outside. do it in, do it outside, and do not expect to play that game right away. There is a an aroma that needs to fade from the board. So, you know, doing it in the afternoon and trying to play it that night could get everyone a little uh, giddy during the... Yeah, uh, possibly. And then uh, Darkling Blight in the chat is saying acrylic-based clear coat might work as well. Yeah, that, that's actually what, it, what the Krylon is for from uh, the Krylon uh, product is. I do not recommend Mod Podge. Um, I have a board downstairs that my daughter goes to protect with Mod Podge, and, well, it'll probably never be damaged ever. It is not a smooth surface anymore. Mod Podge tends to take on the texture of your brush and everything on it. So it, it is not perfectly smooth, which it depends on the game. Fair enough. And while we can't fold the board back up anymore, ever, it's right. now a big <laughs> square. <laughs> Varnish not an option or something you don't want to do. Again, it's, it's expensive, it's stinky, and, and you're not going to know if your game's going to yellow in five years or 10 or 15. That's that's the hard part about that. Now, testers dull coat I have used on many miniatures that I painted back in the 90s that are still perfectly fine. But that's miniatures and not cardboard. So it's hard to tell. So another option that won't damage your stuff if you can find a big enough one to do it is to laminate things. Now, yes, you could laminate a whole board. I've done it. Um, in particular, the splotter unmounted boards are great for this because they're really they're just thick card. They're well worth laminating just to protect them because they're just thick card. And if you get any liquid on them whatsoever, it's just going to soak right in. Um, the 
other thing I've used it for, and it's a bit of the RPG side of things, is dungeon maps. It used to be I played D&D 4E the most, and it had a ton of these awesome fold-out maps while I laminated them all. Um, the added bonus of that is you can then use dry and wet erase markers on them, which was very useful in Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe not as useful for your board games, but besides boards, it's all the other stuff. The, the You technically could laminate a whole deck of cards. I probably wouldn't go to that level, but like the player reference sheets, the thin card player boards, um, anything published by Stonemaier Games and their thin card, they, they love their thin card. Uh, the Terraforming Mars, for example, the, those thin card boards. I, all of it can be laminated. Honestly, a laminator is a purchase any alpha gamer should buy. They're, you're going to find something you're going to want to laminate, and you're going to be like, oh my god, this is awesome, and I'm going to keep laminating things. Yeah, no, and, and RPG players, especially, uh, you, know, you know, if you if you play RPGs as well as board games, even more of a reason to get a laminator because yes. you can protect those character sheets and, and all those reference cards and your spell lists or whatever you want. Uh, it's yep. fantastic. Now, the other thing with laminating is, uh, again, you can use dry erase, but the, you, you, the one thing to be aware of is don't use it as an excuse to be more environmentally friendly. Now, this is about protecting your games. Laminating is going to protect your stuff. So on this argument where we're talking about protecting games, all good, laminating. On the other side, if you've got a roll and write with a thousand sheets and you're like, well, I'll just laminate one instead of using those thousand sheets and I'll save trees, you're actually... No, nah, it works the other way around. The the environmental impact and CO2 footprint for thousands of sheets of paper, you need thousands and thousands to make up for one sheet of plastic you put into the world that won't biodegrade and so on. Yeah, now that there's there's some weirdness here because if you've already got a laminator and you already have the plastic sheets that, you yeah. know, and, and you're not going to be throwing them out. You're going to be protecting something for the long term. Yes, that's a different story. Again, one year first, one uh, single use plastics are horrible. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid them. You don't want to plastic coat anything that is going to be and thrown out in any in the foreseeable future. But as a way to protect things over the long term, mm -hmm. plastic can be a solid off, uh, option. All right. The next thing. Instead of putting your stuff in coin caps, oh, I'm going to jump back a bit. Coin capsules. Red Meeple Ryan's not in our chat room tonight. He's one of our regulars that happens to be a vision impaired meeple. And he usually calls me out on this. He uses coin capsules to make his games playable as well as protect components because he has, um, what's the stud, the dot stuff? Braille. Language. Braille. He has Braille tape and he puts Braille tape on his coin capsules to say what the coin things are. And he's much rather put them on coin capsules rather than put them on physical components. So that's jumping back a bit. But another option to protect your components is buy better ones, which sounds kind of silly, but there is an entire market of upgrading your board game components. And most of these are switching from easily damaged, easily, especially water, beverage, coffee, wine, soaked chits and counters into something plastic that can be cleaned uh, or Bakelite. Or wood. Wood is even easier to clean. Isn't as easy to clean, but definitely easier to clean than a piece of soggy cardboard. Absolutely. There's definitely some benefits to, you know, having these upgraded components, but also not getting rid of the original components so that you still yes. have that, you know, mint in box. If, if, if should be, if that's what you want, uh, component available, should anything else happen, should you lose mm -hmm. a piece, etc. But you also have these generally hardier uh, more durable components that also generally, you know, make the game better to play. That's one of the original reasons yes. for the upgrades is to make the game more enjoyable for play. It just yep. happens to be that they're also more durable as well. In general. Yeah. Most upgrades are more durable. Uh, we talked about elastics for boxes. It's same thing for cards and stuff inside your game. Just, it, it just search board game elastic and you'll find alternatives to your standard hairband or whatever people have been using for years. I cry when I open up games. I, I, we did some thrifting uh, last <laughs> weekend and opening up some games and finding various things held together by, by either hairbands or, or those super thick brown tan elastics and, and digging into corners of cards. Oh, it was frightening. And then the, they were left too long, so they've now become brittle and are stuck to the... Uh, there are alternatives yep. in general. Avoid elastics, oh, but that, there hey, are Velcro options. cable wraps can work. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. There you go. 
I don't. Oh no, it's a clip. I used a clip on this one. I was gonna say, <laughs> do I have a cable wrap here? All right, this is now kind of getting more out there on some of the stuff. But um, one of the things to do to protect your game is avoid humidity. If you are in a humid place, have a dehumidifier. I have one in my basement where my games are. It is not literally in the game room. It's in it's in my laundry room next to it. But it does help if you have central air and get to get a dehumidifier. That is also going to matter. Um, go with that. We they um, Carlos actually hinted at it. Silica gel packs actually exist to keep humidity out of your board game boxes. If you live somewhere humid, um, keep them in your boxes. Like there's just don't toss those out just because you're like, oh, why'd they throw this in here? They will prevent mold and and humidity getting into your game. Just make sure you keep them away from children. Right. There's a reason why they say do not eat, and that's because they will absorb all the moisture in your stomach, too. Yeah. Now, there is at least one board gamer I know who takes this to a higher level. If you really, really, really care about your collection, you could get a moisture, humidity, and temperature-controlled room to store your games in. People do it for scars. People do it for cardboard. Absolutely. It, it, it all depends on how far you want to take the protection and collection and protection of your collection in the board game world. Uh, yes. All the all the available steps are there. If you want a humidor for your board games, it's, it exists. It does exist. Now, one of the things Sean's already mentioned a few times, the big thing you want to do with your components and why you might want upgraded components that don't get banged up or why you might want to use coin capsules is you want to stop things from rubbing. Um, in particular, anything that's painted or silk screened. And one of the things that's great for this are box inserts, things that keep the various components separate. I know people who cry whenever they open a game and there are cards and dice both sitting loose because those dice are going to roll around and those cards are probably going to get dinged up, especially if they happen to be, you know, game science, spiky dice. And not just like some nice rounded wooden D6s. So that is one good way to to help. And then the other thing is like just taking it to actual component separate. Now, baggies are great for this. Like baggies will usually do. That'll be enough to keep your various components apart from each other. But possibly better would be any kind of like plastic capsule holder, which I have some behind me, but you can't really see them. But they're picked up at the dollar store. They're kind of in the corner of the Calax there. Um, we technically get them out of our kids' clay, air dry clay. Those are really good for individual components. Where if you don't want the spiky stars with the spiky pyramids, if you really want to take it that far, then you can separate those out. Personally, I just put all one player's colors all in one bag. And I'm even evil enough, I'll toss a card in there too, as long as it's a reference card, not a play card. Just so it's to me, it's more important to be able to go, here's all your stuff and start playing than it is that that card doesn't have a scuff on it. Absolutely. Again, most you you want to be able to play the game quickly and easily. You want to be able to get it back, put away quickly and easily, and you want to minimize the damage over the long term. Again, all of these things that we're talking about damage wise, very rarely is it going to be the second time you play the game because you put it all in the box. Everything's yeah. going to be ruined. But over a period of time, the mm -hmm. more of the the more the more you shake it, the more you move it around, the more things shuffle is the more wear and tear your game yep. is taking. Now, here's an interesting one that may not affect most people, but something I hadn't thought of. But I remember when um, local game store moved to a new corner with nice big windows where you could see inside. And they originally had their board game collection so you could see it from the street. And it looked awesome. You're like, look at all the games they have. I think it took a week and a half before those games started to fade. Hugen and Munin, the game store before that, did have one set of their shelf to the window, and I think it was part of an inside joke just to see how faded those board game boxes will be. Do not store your games in direct sunlight, and that includes through a window. You can get UV protecting protective layers to put up there, but generally speaking, your windows are not going to do that unless you yeah. have deliberately put up a layer of uv protection your games will fade period now if you're doing the uv protection krylon maybe you do that on your box as well as your board so <laughs> you can you know show off your neighbors your calax in the window that's that's your choice <laughs> but just remember you're also showing that off to anyone else who happens to be lurking around and peeking in your windows yes and the, you've true. kept these nice fancy games in perfect condition for 
hopefully not. Now, this is one that, that I know people who do. Now, this is this is actually common in wargaming where you have paper hex encounter boards. That's a common thing. Many war games are very um, mom and pop made in the back room printed out t- type things. For years, they have been. Now, GMT games and other modern publishers have definitely shining them up. But I've seen many of those. RPG maps are another case. But putting something over your game board to protect it. Now, I have seen this done with Lexan. I've seen it done with plexiglass. I've seen it done with literal glass. I've seen acrylic and more. Often, this has the benefit of giving you a wet or dry race surface on top as well. And the other thing for RPG fans is you can get these with a grid. So you can add a grid to any map by using it. Now, for board games, I have never physically seen anyone do this, but I know a game group that I game with. I haven't been to their house that does this for every game. They have a thin sheet that goes on top of every game they play so that the board doesn't get scratched. And you can also do this just as easily if you have a table. You get a layer of clear acrylic that goes over the table, and mm-hmm. you you know pick it up, put the board down, put the, uh, the acrylic back down on top, yep. and play your game without having to worry about scratching or damaging the board. Now, the last one I've got, Sean may have some more that I hadn't thought of yet, is uh, just a pretty simple one. This is one I definitely do. Keep your games off the floor. Um, Learn this the hard way. Even in upper stories, like it doesn't necessarily be your basement. It just prevents damage from potential spills. Or when you're mopping the floor, when you're cleaning, just just up an inch even. Put it on some type of shelf. And if it is in the basement... Be aware of whether or not you are ba- you have uh, flooding issues in your area. Be aware of the mm-hmm. potential for flooding because nothing you do will protect your game should a flood happen. Yeah. That's almost guaranteed a write off of your game just with just about anything you've done to it because mold. Yeah, <laughs> everything collects mold. So that's one. Of oh, the another one, too, ones. is I, I would recommend keep your games in the house. Seems kind of a silly one, but I've, I've seen people who have games in their deck boxes they bring out, bring them in during the winter when it's going to rain. Um, keeping your games in your garage, only if it's like a temperature controlled garage. I have a friend who did that for years, thought it was great, but then suddenly got a leak roof or a roof leak and lost a, a huge collection of games because they always gamed in the garage and it was perfectly fine. Garages are not built to the same standard that houses are. Now, the next thing is not necessarily about uh, how you are keeping your board game, but uh, how everyone is keeping your board game when it comes out to the table. Yeah, we want to talk a bit about some gameplay etiquette. Um, Like, not don't do this yourself. Like, don't do this yourself. But, like, somehow communicate to the people you're playing with that this is just not cool. Don't bend, fold, twist, turn, crumple anything unless that's part of the game which you tend to only really see in the exit games and escape room games where you're folding things. I'd seen way too many gamers. I'm sitting at the FLGS. We're playing games and some dudes like flicking their cards and I'm like, I'm sorry, can you stop that? And they're like, well, it's not your game. And I'm like, no, it's his over there. And I don't care. That's not good for his game. Like, unless he comes over and tells me you're allowed to fiddle around and twist and, and make little tubes out of your cards. Um, and I've even had someone say it and they're like, oh, it's my game. And I'm like, yeah, but it sets a bad example. It makes people think they can do that. And this even goes as far as uh, tapping. If you've got a hand of cards and you're tapping it on the table firmly, you can really yeah. blunt and damage the edges of, edges of cards. Um, there's just overhandling cards can be a really bad just thing the, the, in general. The constant shift of. Oh, yeah, people can hear this. We can't see it. <laughs> I only have one card, so it doesn't work. But even this, the you know. Poker yeah. chips, I think, are made to be stacked and unstacked. Yeah. You can get away with those. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you cards, do that with my iron clays, I might get upset though. The more the more you are handling the cards, uh, the more you might, might want to think about sleeving them. <laughs> because yes. again, that's you know, protecting those especially edges. Edges are one of the biggest yeah. things on cards. Edges and yeah, edges, corners, they start to split. Now another one, honestly, my rule is 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 no food or drink at the table at best. Like, just don't don't have a meal at, while you're playing a game. Save that, eat first, take a break, whatever. I know people like snacks and people like drinks. And while well, you all should be drinking more water, reminder, everyone take some water. Uh, everyone should try to stay hydrated. Maybe, maybe it's a beer and pretzels game. My rule is none on the game table. 
I have side tables for that. I have six of them in my game room and I put them between people. Every person can easily reach one if they're all out in play. Um, that way, if something does spill, it spills on the side table and then my game room floor and my game room floor is tile. So I'm good. Not on the actual table. Now, better, no food or drink at all. But I get it. People snacking is part of game night. It always will be part of game night. And so if you are going to snack, though, do the whole avoid the sticky, saucy, powdery things. We've talked about this many times on game night etiquette and dealing with player problems. Make sure your treats are appropriate to keeping things clean. Make sure there are lots of uh, paper towels, washcloths, ways for people to wipe off their hands between turns and handling things. Just make it so that people can touch things in clean ways. Yeah, like we always have coffee and or tea at the table, but it's yes. on the side tables. Off the uh, table. Because it, <laughs> we have seen what happens when it isn't on the table. Uh, see our uh, replays of uh, Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, for, yes. Uh, examples. At, at least two, I think. Um, another one I'm going to call out, wash your hands before you start playing, possibly between games and at the end of the night, and even more so if you've eaten in between. Or if you go to uh, the bathroom, wash your hands. Yes, yes. Like, like this is something at this point I expected everyone to have learned during the ongoing pandemic and be better at. Uh, it seems like when we decided the pandemic was done that people didn't have to wash their hands anymore either, which is disgusting. Uh, the whole point of this is to prevent the spread of nastiness between players and 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 whether that's nastiness getting on the games or anything else or in the form of of uh, diseases to just schmutz, right? Like, uh, show up to the game night, right? You're at public play game night. Hopefully you wash your hands before you left home. Go into the washroom for a minute before playing the game. Wash your hands, please. Yeah, and I mean, this is, you know, we were talking, we were joking earlier about the black stuff on the edges of magic cards. Uh, that's... That's what what happens is, you know, things get on your on your hands. Oil, your hands have oil Are on gross. them. That's part <laughs> of what happens with your skin. Your skin yes. exudes oil and that picks up things and that deposits them onto cards. So I guess one we didn't mention above, um, which if you want to take it to that, if you're trying to keep your games in pristine shape, uh, do what you do when you get an old archive book. Wear gloves. There's no reason you don't wear gloves playing games. Uh, that, to me, it's going a little too far, but I'm not trying to put my games in a museum at the end of all this. Though, to be fair, uh, most museums don't actually use gloves for their paperwork uh, work anymore because they have determined that they need some oil and they get dried out and brittle and crack if you <laughs> use gloves and only uh, and only touch them with gloves. Well, I don't think that's going to be a problem with anyone's board <laughs> games. So <laughs> Now, I'm going to take the opposite side here. We've talked a lot about protecting your games and all the various things you can do to keep them in the best possible condition. Uh, mm -hmm. Or as Carl said, so that when, when some, when his family comes around, uh, when they've been hooked into the board game thing, all those games are ready for them to play. Well, I have, and my kids have board games that have been in my family for between 50 and 70. And I think some even old longer years. Mm -hmm. Sure, the boxes are a little beat up, but these games are still perfectly playable. We haven't used Ziploc bags. We haven't used, you know, Kallax shelves or anything else. Uh, they have been near, uh, thankfully none of them through floods, but they have been all too terrifyingly close to floods. But they've just been used. Uh, and, and really, none of the things, the things we've talked about on this list have been done to these games. They're all using the original whatever came in the box to separate the pieces together or lack thereof. Uh, and, you know, 50, 70 years later, my kids can still play them. I can still play them. Uh, I was still playing with, with other people in family at Christmas, yep. a 1972 board game that has never been treated with any special care. Yeah, to be fair, we treat them with respect. You know, I was brought up understanding that a board game was not something that you twisted and torn and, 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 you know, as we were, as we were mentioning here, but that's just basic respect for your property, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, um, which is the absolute minimum we should be expecting for everyone who is playing for everyone, these yes. board games. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, I take this a little further than Sean. When I go back and replay my old games, I tend to then bag the components when I put them away. But. That's more for having it sorted and ready to play than it is about protecting them. 
that's the whole, here's your green player stuff. Here's your red player stuff. Instead of dump everything on the board and everyone starts sorting stuff. Or it's a way to organize the cards. Uh, so most recently, I actually did this with my Talisman 2nd Edition, which up until this point, this is a very collectible, worth a ton of money game, literally got the box dump at the end of every game session. Literally, like we didn't even sort the cards into decks. We just dumped it all in. And then when I went to play, I would dump the entire box on the table. And the start of the game was sort everything by its card backs and sort the chits over here and, you know, put the dice over there. And, and we started playing. But I couldn't take it. I'm like, like now that I, I I care more about hobby games and the shape of my games, I, I everything's baggied now. Now, I didn't get a box insert. I didn't do anything like that. But like all of my spells are in one. All of my adventure decks are in another baggie. All of my characters are in a baggie and so on. I will say that the the I think one of the oldest games in my collection, I did put into uh, a couple of bags for the Christmas game. But that's only because we learned that the designer doesn't want you to use all of the cards that were provided. So I needed a way to separate out the, uh, the publisher yep. uh, card, card build versus the designer's card build. Uh, but and the other thing too, which we, we didn't talk about tonight is repairing games, which could be an interesting follow-up topic sometime in the future. But in general, tape's not bad. The box corner splits. Don't write the publisher and say, I've had this game for a week and the box corner. No, tape it up. It's a game. Use some glue. Component breaks. Use super glue. Like, like I don't know. I, people can take this too far. Absolutely. Again, once you open this, it's not as bad as a car. You're not losing, you know, 40% of the value when you drive it off the lot. But you are using value and the more you play it and the more love you get out of it, it goes up in value for your family, but down mm -hmm. for everyone else. So worrying about resale value, unless you are specifically buying with an intent to, as some of most friends do upgrade the game and sell it at a profit at the end, mm -hmm. odds are good that resale value is negligible. It's, yeah. it's just something you don't need to be concerned about. Uh, unless you are taking that into account when you purchase it, the game. Yeah. And board games are like comic books. Lots of people like to talk about how they go up in value, but they really don't. That market doesn't really exist. Yes, there are exceptions. There are a few out of print board games that may never be reprinted. I'm going to say may because some of them have been coming back. We didn't expect like say dark tower, um, but may or hero quest, even for that example, another example, that's a game that used to sell for a fortune. Um, but that's so few and far between, and you just have to be lucky. Obsessively keeping a thousand games in pristine collection shape is going to be worth way, like cost you way more than the two out of that thousand that are actually worth money eventually. Yeah, the like odds just, that you have Action Comics number one are slim and none. <laughs> yeah. So don't 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 assume that you do. Assume that you don't, and yes. care for things, but don't. Ex, you know, don't, don't go out of your way to, to make sure, you know, everyone wipes their hands with a moist, moist wipe and, and, you know, before their turn, before, you can, like, return. if that's what you want to do, do it. I just, I think that's going too far. Again, you have to balance protection versus enjoyment of the game. And I have always said for a long time, and, and I'm now, I've been in the, the, the hobby long enough that I'm, excuse me, seeing a small problem with this is if I play a card game in particular, say a deck builder enough times that my cards are damaged. I have gotten so much enjoyment out of that game. I owe the publisher and I'm just going to buy another copy. Now where this becomes a problem. And this is what I'm seeing now is as we've lost a lot of publishers, especially in the last five years is the games go to print. And there are now games. I wished I had sleeved because there is no way for me to replace them now. But for years, like from 2020 to 2018, or sorry, 2000 to about 2018, most of the good games were still in print. I could still get them, even going like Bonanza being one of the older. It's like 1998. If I ruin my Bonanza cards, I go to Amiga and buy a new set of Bonanza. But now we're starting to see these older games that aren't getting the reprint. So now I'm like, all right, I get sleeving a bit more. But my old, I used to always say it. I'm like, I'm not going to sleeve a game. If I play a game enough to ruin it, the designer, owe, I, I owe them for another copy for the amount of enjoyment I got out of it. Fair enough. Well, I think there you have some of our suggestions for keeping your games in the best shape possible or the shape you need. 
<laughs> well, what do you do to protect your games? Let us know about it in the comments below because we're sure there are opinions out there. Yes, I want to hear the opinions on this one. Even better, um, instead of commenting, head over to our Discord. That's at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Let's keep the conversation going. I would love to hear what some people have done, what people think is a little over the top, or if you're aghast that we don't do more. Finally, if you've got a question for us like Carlos, head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just please, I don't care if your sister's eating your Uno deck. Welcome to our review of the Thrills and Chills expansion for Sorcerer's Arena from the Op, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this expansion. Now, before we go any further, you need to know that the Thrills and Chills box is not a standalone expansion or standalone game or expand alone, whatever you want to call them. In order to use the contents of this box, you do have to have a copy of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. If you aren't familiar with the base game, I encourage you to take a moment to read our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances core set review on the blog, watch it on YouTube, or check out episode 201 of our podcast, Underrated, where we talk hidden gem games and review the Epic Alliances core set. Now, speaking of reviews, this expansion is fully compatible with other Disney Sorcerer's Arena expansions. So you may also want to check out our Tourney the Tide expansion from last episode, again, also on the blog and YouTube. This uh, Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's Thrills and Chills was designed by Sean Fletcher, the same designer as the base game and published by the op in late 2022. This small box, box expansion has an MSRP of 1999 US. Now, this small expansion gives you three new character options when playing Chapters 2 to 4 of Disney Sorcerer's Arena, the board game. You get Mother Gothel from Tangled, Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas, and the Horned King from The Black Cauldron. Now, to go with these characters, you also get rules for character tokens and a new Afraid status effect. For a look at what you get in this box, check out our Thrills and Chills unboxing video on YouTube. Now, inside the box, you'll find a single folded sheet of instructions, three punch boards, and all the stuff for each character, which includes a large character card, 10 card decks, a standee, and a base. Now, the standees are, of course, protected by a thin film, which was just as much of pain to get off the figures in the base game and the first expansion. I hate this film so much, but you only have to do it once. Now, everything here matches the quality and the colors and the depth and tone of the base game which and, and the first expansion, which is important for card games like this, so I have no complaints whatsoever. The instruction sheet presents new rules introduced with this expansion, of which there are three, two of which are totally new. Now, the first will be familiar to owners of Turning the Tide or anyone who's picked up later expansions. This is the rules for constant abilities. Constant abilities are featured on some character cards and are effects that are in play as long as the character that has the ability is in the arena. Pretty simple. Next, we have a brand new rules for character tokens. These are round, double-sided discs can be put into play by characters, abilities, and cards. Once in play, they are treated as additional characters and are affected Affected as characters for all actions, cards, and abilities. Character tokens do not take turns of their own, but are activated by another character. All of their stats, movement, attack, initiative, and victory points are zero, except health points, which are one. When a knocked out character token is removed from the arena, they cannot have, uh, and they cannot have status effects placed on them. This, uh, this expansion includes one type of character token, and that is the Cauldron Born. Uh, they feature no special rules above the standard character token rules. Since this game was released, there has been a change, much like with Turning the Tides expansion. The Cauldron Born related card texts are being updated to reference only the summoning player's character tokens. Then finally, we have the new Afraid status effect. When a character is afraid, they must use each of their movement phases if possible. At the end of each movement phase, the character takes two damage if adjacent to a rival. Next up, let's get to the meat of this expansion, the three new characters. All right, we're going to start with Jack Skellington, as expected for a character from Halloween Town. A ton of Jack's actions make rivals afraid using that new status effect. This new effect is great for use on melee characters and for getting rivals off of victory point squares. Now, the other thing 
Jack gives you is unprecedented control over static effect counters, both those on your own characters and on your rivals. Due to this, he teams really well with characters that give out a lot of effects, either positive or negative. Now, to get the most out of this ability, the key is to upgrade Jack as quick as you can, because you not only get the move tokens, you increase the number as well. Now, on his own, the Horned King isn't much of a threat. He's no tank either. The thing is, he shouldn't be alone for long. This character is all about summoning Cauldron Born. It's getting these into play and manipulating them around the board that is key to using him well. What's difficult about this is that you only get Cauldron Born when you earn victory points. Mm -hmm. So this character teams up best with characters that can generate them on their own, as well as characters good for holding VP points on the board. Another trick up the Horned, sleeve, Horned King's sleeve is that he has abilities that cause his opponents to banish cards from their discard pile. This is great for preventing the other player from being able to upgrade their cards. Combining this ability with a character that causes opponish, opponents to banish cards from their hands can be devastating. And finally, we have Mother Gothel. Gothel is a control character that can really frustrate an opponent. Her skill gives her opponent a hard choice of banishing cards or giving Gothel stealthy, which could lead to even more cards being banished. She also has abilities to strip status effects, which is great for dealing with annoying effects like Invulnerable or Taunt. Finally, she has an ability that targets everyone with the Princess keyword. While there aren't many characters with that keyword yet, I can see this becoming more powerful the more sets are released. Now, since release, though, the victory point value from Mother Gothel has been reduced by one. She was worth six, it's knocked down to five. Now, that may go back up once there's more princesses in the set. Well, now that you know everything you get with this expansion, it's time to move on to our thoughts. So with this expansion, you not only get three new characters, you get some new rules and a whole new aspect of gameplay. And that's the character tokens or the token characters. To me, this is the most exciting part of this expansion. Now, similar to the ocean tiles introduced in Turning the Tide, character tokens add a whole new dynamic to the battle arena. Their addition changes up the feel of the game and gives players on both sides of the table more to think about. This has been really the most interesting part of the expansions for me. As mm. while the characters are interesting, having new aspects which can be expanded upon and taken advantage of by other sets really broadens the appeal and replayability of the game. So each time they're introducing this new concept, all the other future expansions mm -hmm. can also add more to this concept. Now, besides that, I personally really dig all the three characters in this set. Of the three, Mother, Go Mother Gothel is the most fun to play. I love the hard choices she offered my opponent and the feeling of hopelessness she can bring as the opponent's hand and deck start to whittle down. This was especially true when combined with the Horned King or with Dr. Fusilier from the base game. As someone who faced that trio, I can certainly agree that there was some real hopelessness being felt. <laughs> It would be interesting to see how the meta is developing in organized play around uh, some of these characters. Now, I will admit that team did not pull it off. Sean managed to come back win with no cards in his hand. So I don't know if it was all that great, but it sure was fun. Now, my next favorite character from this set was Jack, Jack Skellington. Now, the one thing that I didn't mention above that I dig about Jack is that he's a tank. I didn't expect him to be a tank. And he is really good at holding victory point spots on the board because of this. Now, this is due to his high health. He has 10 health, which is one of the highest, and that afraid causing ability so that no one wants to end near him. Now, the thing is, though, this only really works on melee based opponents. When if you're against a team with like Demona and Buzz Lightyear in it, you're going to have to change things up and not just rely on fear because they're just going to back off and shoot you. Now, Jack's other big ability of moving status counters and increasing them when upgraded does seem really powerful, and I love the concept of it, and I keep seeing people, whenever I share pictures, going, oh, what kind of combo did you get off? I personally have done a ton of damage. I just haven't quite gotten it to work yet well for me. It reminds me of my experience with Davy Jones. Like To me, those are the two more advanced characters in all of the sets so far that take a little bit more planning strategy and comboing. And I haven't quite figured out how to get the most out of Jack yet. It really is all about making that perfect character group. And judging by the continued adjustment of rules as the organized play develops, what that perfect group might be is still under development. 
Now, my least favorite character in the set leaves you with the Horn King, of course. Now, while I love the concept of character tokens, and I think the way they were implemented is very clear and very well done, they work, it makes sense, I just haven't had a lot of success using them. Now, my main issue is that the character is next to useless without Cauldronborn in play. Most of their 10 cards are all affect Cauldronborn, and if you have no Cauldronborn, they're useless. And they're just not as easy to get into play as I had hoped. Now, I often found that when I finally did get one or two in the arena, my, my opponent just went up with basic attacks to get rid of them before I could pull off anything with them. Now, at this point, similar to the Jacks moving around things, I think this is a me problem. I think this is just I need more practice using the Horn King, as well as I need to figure out a good pair to team him up with. Like, in no way did I dislike the character. I just had a hard time using him effectively. Yeah, I didn't get him into play, but I will say that he's a niche character in the mobile game as well. So it's not just in this version. He's a tricky one. Uh, I was actually thinking as we were talking about this, uh, Scar could actually be a solid yeah. one to put him with because Scar mm -hmm. has that ability to yank people off victory points and send it to places and steal it from them. Yeah, I had thought of that combo, but I haven't had a chance to try it yet. We will probably be reviewing Scar next week. <laughs> Now, what I'm most looking forward to now, though, is to see what happens next. What, what's going to happen with the character token? I said the same thing about turning the tide. What are they going to do with these ocean tokens? Are you going to give me more terrain types? Now that they have a system to have a, a summons or allies or you could, I, I could see sidekicks. It's Disney, right? Like, where, where are the sidekicks going to be in? And other supporting characters. I'm looking, really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen. Like, give me a Peter Pan with a, with a Tinkerbell token that can do something. I don't know. I, I, I can see the potential and it has me excited. Well, unlike uh, the change in turning the tide with separating arena tokens by player, it takes makes a lot of sense uh, for this in character tokens. I'm surprised it wasn't part of the original design. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, they've got the flexibility of these rapid uh, expansion boxes to uh, make up for any possible oversights in that base game uh, within, you know, we're, we're a year and a half now and there are three expansions out. And to be honest, for all you know, it was all there. They're just parceling it out bit by bit. Publishers are known to do that. Possibly a smart way to do it. They want to keep the game as accessible as possible. And I like this way of adding additional rules myself. It also keeps the price down by not having all, yes. these, uh, all these components in one box. Yes. Yeah. At this point, I think you're looking at about 100 bucks if you wanted to get everything at once. If you went all in with everything. If that was the price just for the base game, that's going to turn some people away. Overall. This is a really solid expansion for Disney Sources Arena Epic Alliances. Between this and Turning the Tide, I actually prefer Thrills and Chills. I just had more fun with these characters than I did with the ones in the other box. That said, I am very happy I own both, and I'm looking forward to getting in more plays with Leading the Charge to see how that compares. That's the third expansion. If you already enjoy Sorcerer's Arena, picking this up seems like a no-brainer. Unless for some reason you have no interest in any of the characters in this box, or if, if you only play in family mode, chapter one, this is going to be a safe bet. You're going to get three new characters that all stick out, that all feel quite different from the existing characters. And of course, you don't have to just play them with themselves. You can now combo them with every other player you have. Well, that's it for our review of the Thrills and Chills expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. Another really solid addition to the game. Enjoyed this review? Want to get cool bonus stuff like behind the scenes blog posts, bonus audio, copies of our show notes, and more? Check out the Tabletop Bellhop Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Welcome to a first look at the latest Valeria game, Castellans of Valeria. Now, this is an unpaid preview. The copy of the game provided to us by Daily Magic Games was a prototype that we will be passing on to another reviewer. So please be aware that what we are talking about is a nearly complete game that wasn't quite finished when we got it. Anything said here could change with the production copy, but we don't expect the actual rules to change at all. Now, Castellans of Valeria is being designed by Isaias Vallejo and features artwork from, of course, it's a Valeria game, it's the Miko. It will be launching on Kickstarter on June the 13th, 2023. Once funded, and I don't think that'll be a problem, it will be published by Daily Magic Games and will be available in retail. I do not have an MSRP of it. This is an area majority style board game that plays one to five players with games taking an hour or two, depending on the player count and thinking time of the players. 
we would call this a medium weight game that takes a bit to learn, but flows very well once you start playing. Mm -hmm. So in Castellans of Valeria, players compete to become the Castellan of the newly founded city of Kosk. You're going to be drafting dice, managing four resources, and taking actions to add manors, temples, citizens, ships, lighthouses, and more to the six different districts of the city. Along with this, players will be buying and selling goods, trying to gain influence in the four guilds of Valeria. At the end of each round, magistrates will wander different districts and rank everyone's performance. After five rounds, the player with the most points wins and is declared the new Castellan of Kosk. And normally this is where I would point you to an unboxing video showing off what you get in the box for Castellans of Valeria. But since the copy we played was a prototype, we didn't record one. As it stands now, all of the pictures you may have seen from us show components that will be changed in the final game. Yeah, we know for a fact that in our prototype copy, the wooden components came out smaller than planned. Uh, they actually fit very loosely on the awesome dual layer player boards. I hope those don't change because they're nice and are a little bit small and hard to manipulate. So we do know those are going to get bigger. The other big change I know is coming is when this game showed up, there were three different books that did separate things. There was a separate book for um, solo play. There was a book just on background on the city and the different guilds. And there was the rule book. But the problem was the background book for the guilds also had some of the rules for how some of the cards worked. And in the end, I think the publisher has decided just to make it combined into one big book. Uh, plus, actually, the copy we had had blank spaces that said 200 words. So we do know that is going to change. Now that said, we do know that this game will come with fantastic dual layer player boards and a ton of wooden components. Mm -hmm. All of these bits of wood will be silk screened and really do look great as they start to fill the board. Mm -hmm. As an added bonus, all of the shapes are unique, which helps make the game more accessible. Honestly, except for the incomplete rulebook and guidebook, this could easily be mistaken for a completed game. I am really looking forward to seeing what the production copy looks like, which should be even more impressive than what we saw. Well, let's move on to an overview of play. Note, this is a fairly complex game with lots of moving parts, so please don't take this as a full teach. Mm -hmm. Doing so would take way longer than we want to spend during a review segment. All right, start with each player grabbing a player board and all the wooden bits in their color. Fill the spots on the board with those pieces. Again, two-player board. You're just placing, doing a shape puzzle here because it's pretty obvious what goes where. Uh, one thing to be aware of, though, is watch your starting resources because the starting levels are indicated by a faint white dot. We did miss that the first time we were playing until partway through going, oh, we should have started with stuff. Now, players place their scoring market on the score track and an influence token at the bottom of each of the four guild tracks. Each player in reverse turn order picks any manor to build and places it into an empty district and gets the influence reward for that built manor as well as unlocking whichever ability you've chosen. The board is set up by laying out two sets of citizen cards, creating the wharf deck and adding green, the neutral player towers into any empty districts after the players have placed their manners. Mm -hmm. The round tracker is then placed on the first spot and the game is ready to start. The game is played over five rounds, each of which represents one month in game time. At the end of months one through four, three districts out of the six will score. In the final round of the game, round five, all six are going to score. Each round, players will first draft dice, then spend those dice to take actions. Start of each round, number of dice are rolled equal to the player count plus one times three, which sounds a little confusing. There's brackets over player count plus one. You roll a bunch of dice so that there's three for every player and three left over. Then in turn order, players are going to each draft one die. When a player drafts a die, they get what is shown on that die. Be it influence, gold, or resources like wood, stone, food, and magic. When you gain influence this way, you choose one of the four guild tracts of holy, shadow, soldier, or worker, and move your influence marker up one spot. You then collect any bonus earned for how far up the track you are. And I kind of wonder what names other groups give those four symbols that have been around since Card Kingdoms of Valeria. I know we always call the shadows thieves and we always call the um, holy religious or clerics. So <laughs> I think each group probably has their own name for those. Now, once all players have drafted three dice, they then begin taking actions. They spend one die at a time. Each action has a specific die face associated with it. And when using the matching die, you get a bonus. No, you can still use any die to take any action. You just get the bonus if you use the right one. 
Most of these actions have you placing things out into a single district on the board, with the cost being some of a resource plus an amount of gold equal to the number of the same same other types of that piece already existing in that district. Some actions will include sub actions that you can also do after completing the main action. Similar to pretty much all other Valeria games, magic is a wild card resource that can be added to any other resource in order to pay a cost. The trick, as always, is that you have to pay some of the original resource to start with. You can't pay for something with only magic. Now, the various actions, we're going to cover each of them fairly quickly. I'm just going to go across the player board, top to bottom, left to right. Um, first is ship. Buy and sell goods based on the currently face-up wharf card. You're going to have to spend crates to do this. You start with two crates. You can unlock a third during play. After buying and selling, you then have the option to build a ship. These cost a couple wood, and you got to pay gold for any ships that are already there. Finally, you can pay two gold to move a ship. This is the only building once built, I'm saying building, but it's a ship, that can be moved once it's in play. Now, if you used an influence die to do this, you also get the bonus of going up on one of the guild tracks of your choice. And ships, like many of the things in the game, count for one point once we're scoring districts. Now, you use the harvest action to get the resources currently shown on your dice, whether the dice are used yet or not. You also get to go up on one the guild track of one of your choice. If you use a magic die to harvest, you will also gain one additional resource of your choice. After harvesting, you have the option to build a windmill. Windmill costs two food plus uh, and, and uh, any potential gold uh, for windmills that have already been placed in the area you are going to look, place. Windmills are placed between districts and count as one half of a point for each of the adjacent district. Now, the manor action lets you place a manor out on your board. Now, this is the free action you got at the beginning of the game as well. Except for that free one, you're going to have to pay wood and potentially gold, again, based on how many manors are already there. When building a manor, including the one at the start of the game, you get to pick which one off your player board to remove. Each one of these gets a player some kind of unlock ability that you're going to get for the rest of the game. Now, most of these abilities boost existing actions, but there's a couple interesting ones, like one that unlocks your third shipping crate that I talked about for the first action, lets your gold track go a little longer. And there's a special manor called the Lighthouse that's going to give you points for any ships in the district it's placed on. Now, when you do place a manor on the board, you're going to get to go up in two of the guild tracks that are on the board. You're going to go up one in both tracks based on which district you're in. Now, if you do use a wood die to take this action, you get a free wood before paying for anything else. And manors, like most pieces, count as one in the district they're scoring. Now, the temple action lets you place a temple on the board. Temples cost two stone and potentially some gold. When a temple is placed, you go up on both the guild tracts in the district, uh, as listed on that district, by two. Now, when you use a stone die to take the temple action, you gain a bonus of one stone before paying any costs. Temples count as one point in each of the uh, each in their districts when scoring. Recruit is the final action available and lets you hire citizens. You pay a cost in food based on where the citizen card you want is located at the top of the board. You then gain one influence in the guild shown on the citizen. You then take a citizen token from your player board, place it in the district of your choice, and go up one more on a track, but this time the track is based on what district you put them in. Now, if you use a food die when taking recruit, you get a free food before paying costs. Now, citizen tokens count as one point for each district. In addition, each citizen breaks the rules, the citizen card. They do things like let you manipulate the dice when spending, manipulate the dice when drafting, give you additional resources when you take certain actions, and so on. There's all kinds of these. Now, in addition to spending a die to take an action, players can also choose to build a monument. Mm -hmm. These cost gold and only gold. Players start with one of each of three types of monuments. Monuments give you an immediate guild influence boost, plus they give you points during scoring round based on what exists in the districts that they are built in. For example, the statue monument gives its owner one point per temple in that district, while the gate gives points based on the number of citizens in adjacent districts bridged by the gate. There can only be one of each monument type in each district mm -hmm. or area of placement area for the monuments. Now, one thing to watch for when taking these actions is a chain of effects. It's the powers you've unlocked by placing manners, so the powers on your boards, and the citizen cards you purchased. Powers from both of these can modify the rules and are honestly easy to forget when you're in the middle of taking your turn. 
Now, once players have taken three actions each, the round ends and scoring begins. The spot the round marker is on indicates which districts will score. You go through each district, one by one, awarding points based on majorities. Basically, players count one point per thing of their color in that district, then the player with the most points gets six points, the second gets four, and the player with third most gets two. Mm -hmm. Monuments don't count towards area majority, and windmills only provide half a point. But otherwise, you just add up how many things of each color and, the, and give out the points based on that. Next, you score the wharf by comparing how many cargo cubes from each player are there with points awarded for first, second, and third. After district storing, you're then going to give points for your lighthouses, which I mentioned were to pay for ship, and the monuments that have been placed on the board. Note, these score every round regardless of what district they're in. So they score every round of the game no matter what. Finish off the round by passing the first player marker clockwise, flipping over a new wharf card, adding a green neutral building to a random district, and refreshing the citizen tracks. Now, After the fifth round, there is one final thing you need to do. Score the four guild influence tracks. First place on each track gets six points, second gets four, and third gets two. After this, the player with the most points wins and is declared the new Castellan of Kosk. With that overview done, let's move on to our thoughts on this, the newest Valeria game. So there is a lot going on in this game, and there are a lot of components. There's a lot of stuff, and it can be very overwhelming at first. I really expected this to be a much heavier game than it was. This is especially true during the first learning game and during your initial teach, when even just teaching the game is a little difficult. Besides all the different components, all these different building types, I'm going to call them buildings, even though they're citizens and ships, each of these all over your player board, they're also filled with icons. And to be fair, those icons aren't really clear until you learn what it all means. Yeah, there are a lot of interacting parts here and things that trigger other things and act differently based on how you pay, which, yes. which just makes it more difficult. And usually, like, I find the iconography in Valeria games to be very clear. But this felt like a race for the galaxy level of confusion when I was first learning the game, especially reading that initial rule book that came in our prototype copy. Now, thankfully, the designer or was the publisher, I'm not sure which, did reach out and provide everyone who had a preview copy with some great reference sheets that I am very pleased to say will be in your copy of the game. However, you get it. You want these. I will admit I spent a lot of time looking back and forth between the reference sheets and the player board that first game, just reassuring myself I wasn't forgetting things. Yeah. Though I will say by game three, I had it all down, all I needed to do. And even while writing this review up in prep for the show, I just grabbed a player board to remember what the different actions are and what the costs were. Because once you do have it, I just like Race for the Galaxy, it's internalized and it actually works rather well. But it's going to take a bit to learn it. And what I will say is that once I did internalize it and we actually started playing and once we started stepping through every action, okay, place the building, then do the thing and go up on the track and do the thing. And then like some other player, like, oh, don't forget the sub action. You can build a windmill now, right? Once we got that down, I found the game actually played rather quick and flowed very well. And what looks like too many decision points didn't even lead to that much AP or analysis paralysis. By the end of the first game, after seeing the in-game value of the various actions and why you might want to take them, everyone at the table fully understood not only how everything worked mechanically, but also why it worked and how it worked strategically. And every game I have played this, where I've taught the game, this led to people planting to play a second game now that they got it. In general, this is a good thing, but it also means that to really enjoy this game, you're probably going to need to play it at least twice. Once in a learning game, and then once you grok it, you can play to win. I would say this is pretty standard for the games of uh, this level or higher levels of complexity. You're going to absorb things that first game and get into exploring different tactics in the second game. Now, once I had everything down, I found I really enjoyed this game. This is a medium weight game that requires a lot of strategy and planning ahead for your actions, while also rewarding tactical play and adjusting those plans based on what the other players are doing. Unlike other medium weight Euros, this didn't feel at all like multiplayer solitaire. I always find a lot of these games with their own private player boards and things kind of feel like you're doing your own thing. Every action you take is going to affect the other players in some way, whether that's drafting a die they needed, hiring a citizen they planned on getting, 
building in a district they were controlling, moving boats so that their lighthouses no longer score, and more. All of it matters. In fact, you're probably going to spend at least a small amount of time cursing fellow players, either because they've drafted what you need or taken an action which has priced you out mm -hmm. of the action you had planned. Now, a side effect of this interaction is that it keeps players engaged, even when it's not their turn. Between planning your own moves and watching what everyone else is doing, you find yourself constantly analyzing the board and looking for opportunities and trying to outsmart your opponents. This, of course, also means it's going to be limiting if you're looking for a game where you can chat at. Yeah. It's not in any way a casual game. You need to focus on the boards. Now, the downside of all of this is that Castles of Valeria, to me at least, is so far the driest of the Valeria games. This is a very mechanical, mathy game. There's not a lot here that says Valeria. And really, except for the fact that one of your resources is magic, I don't get a fantasy feel of this at all. I don't feel like I'm in a fantasy setting. This feels like a medieval city builder, not an epic race to finish a city before the hordes attack. Yeah, there's, there's no tension at all. Uh, if there's a horde coming, no one seems to have mentioned it to us. <laughs> now, that's not to say this doesn't feel like a Valeria game. Uh, there's enough there thematically um, and, and looks aesthetically like the use of Miko's artwork, that alone. The four main guilds, which are the same four guilds you're going to find in most Valeria games. Um, the similarity of icons and token shapes like your magic is that little blue triangle. Your food's the weird. Well, I don't know if it's an apple or a peach, but what are the two? I've seen that. That was in one of the small box Valeria games. Like it looks like a Valeria game. Like if I look at it, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's a Valeria game. And I'm glad to see the Valeria license branch out as it did with, say, Thrones of Valeria. But it just feels like this could be better tied to more of the other Valeria games. It is, however, better tied to the theme than some recent outings. And the more you make use of citizens certainly helps it feel that yeah. um, feel more Valerian, both with the artwork and the die manipulations and combos that those citizens bring to the game. I found this interesting. I got a bit of a folk on a map area majority feel when playing this, like a war game feel, right? It, it kind of felt like a war game. Um, Castlelands of Area kind of reminds me um, most specifically of the all-time classic area majority game, El Grande. The difference, though, is that in this particular thing, the things you're putting out on the map are buildings in general, or buildings, uh, boats, and, and citizens, and arches and temples, and not troops. So you're not putting forces out. You also don't get the movement you see in war games. You're not invading and taking over territories or anything like that. But you do get that ebb and flow as control between regions shifts between players each district and each round. It will be interesting to see what happens when the final player pieces are used. As the districts were reasonably visually crowded, mm -hmm. but not as physically crowded uh, as, as they can be when... You expect from the amount of building you're doing in each True. of these districts. I will say what I loved at the end of the game is just getting a picture of our completed city with everything in 3D standing up. And I thought that was actually a really cool look. And I'm like tempted to use that in an RPG setting somehow is here's our next city with its six districts. And look, there's a temple over here and there's a gate over there. Overall, I was really impressed by the prototype copy of Castlelands of Valeria, the daily magic game sent to check us out. While it was a bit rough to learn, and the iconography can be overwhelming, it didn't take long for the people I played with to pick everything up, and then the game started to flow very well. It's a surprisingly quick game for its depth once you have players who know what they're doing. The component quality here is, is awesome. Like, it, it is top-notch. Uh, even with the tiny ones, bigger will be a little better. The, the, the two-layer player board, the amount of wooden pieces all silk-screened on both sides, that's the kind of stuff you don't always see, and it's great to see. Now, while there were some issues with our prototype comp copy, like, again, things weren't quite the size they should have been, things didn't nestle very well, and there were some rulebook issues, I fully expect every single one of these to be fixed with the production comp. The one issue I don't know if they're fixing, uh, and the final issue, is the icons on the citizen cards. Now, while they all have references, as Valeria players would expect, every card has a reference uh, in, in one of the manuals, they aren't always as clear without checking mm -hmm. as the ones on the player board became, for instance. Uh, this can have the effect of reducing their use in the game, and they are intended to be an important part of play. 
Yeah, and Sean's calling that out because in games we played, we had someone ignore the citizens because they didn't want to bother looking up what they did. So that is a thing. And and I, I'm going to guess that iconography is not going to change, but the reference should be more readily available and easier to read than what we had to deal with. We right. didn't even find it because it was in what I thought was a lore book. Now, as things stand now with the prototype we played, I strongly recommend, I, I'd say most Euro gamers, most, most hobby game groups, check this out, um, whether on Kickstarter or once it funds and it's available in retail. I fully expect this to fund and deliver. Daily Magic has a great track record of successful Kickstarters that did deliver. This is a really solid area majority game, and it seems like the perfect medium weight game that a wide variety of groups will enjoy. It features a nice balance of perfect information and randomness that's going to really appeal to Euro fans will also love the strategic and tactical depth. You need to plan out your actions carefully and plan ahead, especially when you're drafting those dice and plan out your three moves for the turn, but also be able to adapt on the fly based on what the other players are doing. Now, if you love card kingdoms of Valeria, but haven't delved deeper into the Valeria world with other games, I think players should be aware that this is a step up in complexity. Yeah. Not a huge step, but one worth mentioning so that you make sure your group is ready to take that te- step up. Now, what you aren't going to find here, and I don't think there's any real confusion like bo- based on the box art of anything, people making this mistake, is you're not going to find a thematic fantasy game. There's no feeling of adventure here, and except for the fact that you have a resource called magic, this could be a historic game and not a fantasy one. It also really doesn't have a lot of Valeria feel, at least not to me. So it's getting really hard to say what is a Valeria feeling game anymore with the number of different ways they branched out. But to me, it just didn't, I I don't know. There was something, there was no conflict that seemed to be missing in this. There was no fighting enemies or exploring kingdoms. It just, I I felt it was missing a bit of that. But again, it just could be, I'm used to playing the older Valeria games as opposed to some of the newer ones. Yeah, while we haven't played it from my reading, I feel thematically this is going to be in a vein more like uh, Guild Academies of Valeria, which mm. still hasn't actually delivered yet. Um, but this has taken the world in a slightly different direction than Shadow Kingdoms and Card Kingdoms and even the recent Dice Kingdoms, which are that combat and into the more the, the more city life, still non-combat building, yeah. based uh, side of the Valeria world. Now, personally, I, I think it's obvious. I can't wait to see how this, this Kickstarter campaign goes. I'm looking forward to it launching. Um, I'll be watching to see what the production improvements are. And I really want to see this new combined rule book and reference sheets and see how well that's presented. That's I have a vested interest in that one. And if it's not done well, I've got an email contact. I may be like, hey, no, no, this still isn't good. Um, what I'm really curious about to see, though, is if they add anything to this since the, the the prototype copy. So, for example, we previewed the prototype copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I had no idea Rise of Titans was going to be put in as a Kickstarter thing. So uh, Daily Magic is known, not known for like a bunch of stretch goals and the game keeps getting better and keeps getting better, gets getting better, but they tend to throw in some Kickstarter exclusives or something that'll be available for retail later that we haven't gotten to see. And I want to know what that is. Well, that's it for our preview of Castellans of Valeria, an area majority game set in the Valeria universe. Now, there sure are a lot of Valeria games out there now. What are your favorites? Let us know in the comments below. Now, for a somewhat more detailed overview of play and lots of pictures of our prototype copy, check out my Castellans of Valeria written review over on the blog. Listening to this on your podcatcher of choice? When the episode is done, why not leave us a review? The more reviews we have, the better chance our show will get noticed by someone new. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So it's actually been a busy couple of weeks uh, between our anniversary vacation and Mother's Day and just having some time off with not recording a show on a Wednesday. Gotten in a solid amount of gaming myself. How about you? Uh, well, I got in some uh, some Siege of Valeria solo play, and also uh, my son and I got to get, try the DC Rivals Flash versus the Reverse Flash, finally. And that's on top of the games we played together as well. So mm-hmm. we'll start off with those. Uh, first was a game Sean played with D and I, and that was checking out Kitara from Yellow. This is an older Yellow game, um, one that I picked up locally due to finding it for a good price. 
And I definitely got more than my money's worth at this point. Even even after that one play, I kind of felt like I got my money's worth. And I, at this point, having played it a few more times even after that, I don't think I would have complained paying full price for this game. Yeah, this was a um, shockingly odd but engaging area control game. Uh, unexpectedly solo, solid. I mean, you look at the box and you... You, it's easy to dismiss this game mm-hmm. uh, until you get it on the table and it turns out to be a pretty fun game. And I so one of the things that stuck out right away when I opened it up was uh, they have a cheetar, cheetah centaur that is just awesome looking. And then you get the player boards with these oversized animals being written by heroes. Like it has a really nice aesthetic. I love the look of it. Um, this is an area control game. You have a rather small map, uh, impressively three different maps for different player counts, including a totally separate player board for two player. So if we ever, I don't think it's out there yet, but if we get our unboxing out, I'm kind of baffled by the small thing. <laughs> That's because I didn't realize that was for two player only. They, they actually give you a smaller, physically smaller board for playing two player, which is really cool. Um, and this is just a, an area control war game. Um, you start with three troops and play at your home base. You use cards to tell you what you get. So you start off with one card that gets you the ability to draft up to two cards deep, which is a little weird until you see it, Um, gives you three starting troops, gives you two moves, and that's it. And then you draft a new card. And if it has more troops on it, you put those troops on the board. If it has more moves, you can take more moves on your turn. It shows more cards. Well, the next time you draft, you get more options. And that's pretty much it on the first. And then you move all your troops. And then this is just move. Movement is group, like grab a group of troops and move them. Leave some behind if you want. but. A group is a group. Um, combat is uh, reminds me of Small World. If you have more troops, more things you picked up than your opponent has in the spot, they got to run away. What's interesting, though, is there's no killing. There's no wiping out troops. So you don't get that whole Small World of slowly battling people back. They just retreat and, and are, are off that space. Yeah, well, while it's aggressive and infuriating, the only time units leave the board is if you starve them out by not having enough cards at the end of your turn. Now, the, there's some interesting stuff here that to me seems to have come from other games. One of your troop types is a hero. Now, they're not more powerful. All the three troop types in this game all are just as combat worthy. But if you attack with a hero, you get the pull from a bag and it'll be a victory point token from two to five. And it really reminds me of battles in Eclipse. Once, once everyone's done their moves, you then score. You get two points per Cheetar you have in Ruins. And then you have to look at your warriors in the planes, and you can only hold one card for every plane you control with warriors in it, which is hard. Keep those planes to keep those cards to keep your armies in play. There's just a lot going on here, and we found it really tight. Like, three-player didn't seem to have a gang-up problem, which three-player area control games can, where two players gang up on someone. I'm pretty sure you could. Like, if you if you were those kind of players, you probably could, but we could, we found... The sparsity on the board tended to make you kind of do a rush and then have to pull back and then do a rush and have to pull back. It was a good flow. Also, on top of that, the layout of the board, the actual interconnectedness of the different areas made for a a really interesting. It looked like it was very orderly and, and, and sort of like clockwork organized. But then you started to look at some of the fuzzy borders and things you, you ended up having edges meeting other areas that you didn't necessarily expect yeah. on first. Uh, so you were able to move in more ways uh, than you would have expected normally, which was great because you could mm-hmm. move around the board faster, but it was also tougher because there were more aspect, you know, more directions towards you yeah. as well as more choices where you could go to attack. Yeah. This very much seemed like a, an attack war game. I don't think you could turtle in this game and win. Well, and the, the big thing about turtling was if you turtle, you lose cards. Yeah. So you, you don't can't own have, enough planes. You, you no longer, so you you no longer have enough army. Uh, army. Yeah, you no longer have your army. Uh, component quality is excellent, like like really excellent. You get these really uniquely shaped meeples. Now, they're all the same for the different player colors, but you can clearly tell apart the leader, which is huge, riding a beast, the cheetar, which has a centaur-looking shape, and the warriors, which have these like big fuzzy headdresses or something. Um, and, and the art was great. The card quality is great. You actually get two full sets of decks of cards to draft from one, a little bit more cutthroat than the other, which was just a cool thing. And I already said three boards, what game comes with three, well, two separate boards, one, two sided and a third. I extremely impressed. Like yellow, I I think nailed it with this game. 
And it's kind of sad to see it at bargain shops. Now, that being said, I feel like it might not have that much longevity. But that being said, it's absolutely great for a few plays, which a lot of games these days, that's all you can say about them anyway. Yes. So that's the other thing we haven't really mentioned is lightning quick. This is a, you know, play once, twice, three times in a row. No problem. Especially when we play two player and two player have the bonus of um, portability. Like this is something I can play up at a bar. So I know not all bars have room for it, but I just, I always think about, we played Azul on a bar, you know, with the bartender right there hitting us drinks and this would fit. And like, I, I almost want to call them bar games, but people think of that meaning something completely different is how many two player games will fit. Cause you just put your player board on one side, your, your player stuff on the other and the map in the middle. Now this does take up a bit of space just cause you need to put out a six card mark. That is the only part that takes up a little more room than I'd like when playing two players. Totally fair. Uh, D points out that uh, yellow is pulling out of North America, which may have also led to the. uh, Yeah, that could just be why it is. It's just they're emptying their warehouses. That that could be the reason. To me, that makes more sense than gameplay. I think, unfortunately, people aren't buying this because of the cover. It has a very strong African look, and I think that is going to turn away some gamers. Unfortunately, fair. Yep. Uh, Next was Castellans of Valeria. Um, the show game Sean for the second time. We played the second time three players. Um, I, I don't have any more to say. Do you have anything more to say we didn't cover in the review? No, I think we covered this pretty thoroughly and uh, fairly for the review preview. Uh, next we get to the vacation gaming. So Deanna and I were out of town for uh, the longest we've been out of town for quite some time. And I'll be good. This won't be like Sean Con. I'm not going to give all the awesome restaurants we found and all the, the awesome food and beer we had. This isn't a con wrap up. So we're just going to stick. The gaming related thing. So the first game we played was Aqualin, and I was utterly blown away because I had to use the washroom. So Deanna was bored and was reading the rule book and caught a wording in the rules that I misinterpreted. And we've been playing Aqualin wrong since our review, which I, I feel bad. Like we, I actually, we should go correct our review. I didn't even think of that yet. We need to go correct our review and possibly do an apology in next episode's announcements. Um, This totally changes the game. And I don't know if it's for the better. So the rule is we always said you move a piece on the board and then you play a piece. And that's, that's the rules. I just taught you how to play, but we said, when you move a piece, you move it in a straight line until it hits something and stops. That is not true. You move it up to until it hits something and stops. So you don't have to slide the whole board. It's not a block game, which I thought it was. It's it's you can move it two squares, three squares, one square, and then put a new one. Man, does that change the game? What's funny though is at the time I'm like, oh hey, I guess you could interpret it that way. So I go on Board Game Geek, and there's a thread, and there are people in there that are like, okay, the designer comes on, is like, nope, that's the rule. I thought it was clear. Move up to. That's what up to means. And people in it are like, why is every single actual play and review out there then wrong? And the designer is like, I don't know, but this is the rule. And I got to say, you got to kind of blame the rule book writer there if that many people are getting it wrong. But it's shocking because the how to play video I watched, a review I read about the game all said the same thing. We did move a piece until it hits an edge. I don't know. I, 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 I haven't decided because I kind of like the old way. It's definitely easier to teach and learn. Like, here's how I play. Slide until it does it. This adds so much bigger a decision space of now I can move any place up to one, two, three, four, five, eight places. The bo- it becomes overwhelming. Yeah, it's interesting. I I, I, I went on, uh, you said you'd, you'd been doing something wrong. So I jumped onto Board Game Geek and clicked on the forums and glanced and uh, immediately picked out the rule that you had been doing wrong based on the forum discussions. Uh, the yeah. one I saw wasn't actually the designer. It was the German lo- uh, localizer, I think. Who okay. Was, uh, <laughs> who was uh, To be fair, it might have been the German localizer. I didn't uh, click on their name. They were obviously someone who knew the game and they had the right badges to indicate they were someone who should know the game. Yeah. So yeah, Aqualim with new rules. And and I uh, Gwen <laughs> new brings rules, this, the right rules. <laughs> the right rules, yes. And Gwen brings this one to school and she's like, Oh, I've been teaching it wrong too. And she's like, I think I like it better the other way. And I'm like, Yeah, it's definitely different. So yeah, we we need to uh, I'd offer an apology probably. I should probably put that in the announcements for next week and and go and update our reviews. Speaking of which, if anyone knows how to overlay text on YouTube, I've seen there's a whole conversation in the board game reviewers group. Talking about how to do it, and I can't get it to work. They keep saying 
you hit edit on the video and then hit add text. I can't find an add text button. Now, maybe it's something for the next tier of YouTube. Like these other people are, are partners as opposed to we're affiliates. But supposedly you can add text overlays to existing videos. I wouldn't think to existing videos, possibly to videos before you release them. No, these are once they're live and they were showing examples of videos they've done it on. And I'm, all I'm thinking is these are people with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So no, to the best of my knowledge, the editor is the editor. It's a piece of crap, no matter what level you are. I've heard everyone yeah. complaining about it. Well, I don't know how they're doing it, but supposedly you can add corrections. I need to figure it out because I don't want to re-upload a whole video to fix a, the one correction. Anyway, moving on to games. Next, two-player Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Um, wanted to play more with the expansions and prep for tonight's show and probably next week because we'll probably review leading the charge. We'll have done one a week for the last three weeks. Which, I don't know. Feels good for some reason. Um, Deanna's really getting into the game more. Like I, she she was skeptical of the game. Um, not only just because like whatever it's Disney, it's a card game. The the reading issue, but also like she tried Warhammer Underworlds and was like, no, this is just not my kind of game. She's not really into skirmish wargaming, but she's really liking this one. I'm um, really digging the variety in the characters, how thematic the cards and abilities are, how everyone feels different. Yeah, it, it's really easy to dismiss this with just the core game, uh, especially if you, you know, you start with the chapter one and the chapter two, mm-hmm. which are really basic, uh, you know, super lightweight ways to play it. Uh, and, you know, there's only so many cards in the core, so many different characters in the core game, and you can learn all the cards and figure out what the best combos are possibly. But the more, as soon as you start adding expansions, you get a lot more game. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I would really like to see some some local organized play starting up to help support the game, too. Yeah, I don't know anyone locally is doing it. We could reach out to the local game stores and see if they're interested. Uh, next up, shopping. Um, we we bought some games. I managed to find a massive, extremely heavy box of Marvel Legendary. It's obviously not just the core game. It's the core game box. It obviously has multiple expansions, all sleeved, all in card protectors with Sharpies written what's inside each box, like X-Men, Heroes, Doom. I don't even know. This box was filled corner to corner with cards. I haven't even started to take this apart and figure out what's there and what's not. Now, the one problem is there are no instruction books for anything. And I know there's expansions in there and there's no board because Legendary does normally have a board you play on. So we're going to have to figure out something for that if we ever play it. Now, I do think the board is just like placeholders for everything in that game. Um, I also know you can buy neoprene mats. So who knows? Uh, so I, uh, you get the Marvel stuff and you've been getting into that. And well, I get DC. So I did manage to rebox the multiverse. Uh, that was another thing I got done. Uh, it was a uh, an interesting one. I don't have a scale handy, but you definitely need to lift with your legs with this new multiverse box. Uh, and I'm still missing a couple of the small box expansions, uh, at least. I don't think I'm missing any of the the big kits. The big, but uh, I believe I'm missing one of the crises and one of the the small uh, expansions. You know, we do have a scale here. So if you ever bring it over, <laughs> we should remember to bring it upstairs. There we go. Put it on the scale and see. So the other thing I found, uh, that was a thrift find. Another one was Kings in the Corner, under four bucks. Got my four bucks out of it uh, the first time we sat down to play. Now, this is an old school traditional card game that people's grandparents have played and their parents have probably played. Uh, it's a ladder based card game where you're trying to play cards in order. Um, kind of feels like multiplayer solitaire, but like not. Like I mean, when I'm talking board games where multiplayer solitaire is there's no interaction. No, this is solitaire with interaction because it's got the whole thing where you're playing cards in order, swapping between reds and blacks, and then you can move the stacks to other stacks and stuff like that. It really does feel like solitaire. Um, What's interesting is the version I bought is from Jax, and Jax adds in some unique things to it to make it a little different than traditional game. The big thing being a chip based scoring set of rules which I actually really enjoy. It's at the start of your turn, you have to put a chip in and then at every turn you have to keep putting a chip into the pot. And then at the end, when you voided your hand or done, whatever it is you have to do, I think you void your hand. Is that right? Yeah. You're trying to void your hand. Sorry. Uh, once you void your hand, you then collect all the chips in the pot. Plus you get an additional chip for every card the opponents have. So that was kind of cool. Cause I, like I looked up how to play this online and it didn't include those rules at all. It's specific to this version. And while the other really cool thing is this plastic tray that you fold out and put on the table, 
that gives you uh, the pot to put their chips in, which actually like floats underneath the deck you draw from, which is kind of a nice touch. And then these trays to hold the cards, because there's a whole thing where the kings stack upwards, but the other cards have to be splayed so you can move them. And it's got this like plastic holder that perfectly holds it so you can see what the bottom card on the stack is and the top card on the stack and not the rest. And I'm just like, oh, that's just a cool thing. And then, like for four bucks, I'm like, the plastic tray alone is just neat. This seems to be a new thing with you, which is basic card games, but with fun trays. <laughs> that must be it. Um, next up was trying the two games we already talked about. Um, the, the games I talked about, we play with Sean, we tried two player. So we tried Katara two player. It worked pretty well. Um, tiny board. That tiny board worked really well. Uh, was super cutthroat. Took up less room. Um, Battles for the Temples was really tight in this game. It was I score my cheetahs, you push me out, you score your cheetahs. I push you out and I score my cheetahs. That kind of went back and forth. But what we found really hard in this game wasn't the cheetah scoring. It was the planes trying to keep enough planes to keep enough cards out in play. There was more scarcity in that two player game that we did not see in the three player game. Yeah, this is uh, the first game where I have ever seen a whole other player, a whole other game board, not player board, game yeah. board for the two player game. Like it's not just the flip side of the main board because that is also a game board. That's for the four yes. player game, but of a, a whole other game board for just two players uh, is wild, but also really cool. And then Castellan's two player worked. Um, I was concerned. Area majority games don't always work great with two players. Um, for the district scoring, what fixed it was that green player tower thing where every unopposed and, and when there's no, no at the beginning of the game, every district your players didn't choose gets one. And then you rolled the random die to figure out where one came in. And in this particular game, green built up one area that we just let them have the whole game, which was kind of amusing. Like every time we rolled the random roll, we rolled four. Um, this made the district scoring work perfect. Like it felt like there was a third player there. The problem was though, there's nothing for a ghost player on the guild scoring. And that was just you win or I win. And by the end of the game, we evenly split. I was higher on two guilds. She was higher on the other two guilds. And I, it felt like that would happen almost every game unless you really tried to focus just on it. I, I, I didn't love it, two player. Um, I will say it felt like it could have a runaway leader problem. Um, D set up a really good combo on round one. There was, she managed to get the, the peasant that you had, where at the end of the round, you get the two resources and then comboed that with a, a shipping based thing so that she would have extra resources to ship there was nothing i could do to catch up like like it felt like at the end of round one i knew what the final score was going to be at the end of round five and i tried to catch up but it just felt like everything i was doing was reactionary i'm like oh you took that district i can take it back now oh you took that citizen so i'll have to take this one i i personally won't be playing this two player not again i'll, I'll happily play it with three four five no problem i like the game but for two players there's other stuff i own i'll play katara two player instead yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of the the final the final game on this uh, to uh, change it or keep it the same. Whatever happens, it's, I'm just really looking forward to seeing how the the final product ships. Yeah. Uh, next, getting back to cards, games with plastic trays, we played some Racco, which is to be expected on any of our vacations. Anyone who's been a fan of the show for the past three months or so has probably talked about us discover heard us talk about Racco. So. Yeah, we played that, and then we played a brand new to me game, Skip Bow, which was available in the hotel room. Yeah, this is one is a classic that my family has loved for years. So this is another ladder game where you're building up from one to twelve, but very different from Kings in the Corner. It didn't feel like solitaire at all. It felt like its own standalone game. You get a deck of cards. You're trying to play through it. I couldn't believe how big the decks were, like the amount of cards you had to go through. Now you're building piles of cards in the center from one to twelve. You do this, you get cards in your hand, you play them onto the piles, you can build new piles, uh, or you have your own discard piles, and it's kind of manipulating those to try to get a combo off. And it's always really rewarding when you're like, I need to play this 12, and you're like, 8, 7, or sorry, 7, 8, skip bow, because that's a wild, 10, 11, 12, oh, my next card was a 1, and I got a 2 over here, and it always felt really good when that happened. Yeah, this one was always a morning before the bus sort of game for the kids and mom especially. Uh, it's super easy to set up and get going, but you just don't always care that you're not getting through a whole game. It's easy to walk away from it. It's just the playing it is the most fun part of the game, I think. See, that was the problem we had is we were trying to play by the rules to the full count and play the full game. 
as were in the instructions that came with it. Hey, I didn't have to Google the instructions. It was nice. And it was interesting. At first, I thought it was neat. Like I, I, the, the way it worked, it took a couple seconds to kind of see what you're trying to do and how you might want to build those discard piles. And I'm like, ah, oh, that was a lot of fun. And like Deanna was really enamored with it. She's like, this is a smart game. And then we finished our first round. Someone got through the whole deck and we did some scoring. And then we started the second round. And the second round was okay. And then we decided to play the third round. And at this point, we were like kind of making the motions, getting distracted by our phones, kind of. And we had a lot of rounds where nothing happened, where you just drew a card and you put it down in your discard and drew a card and put it down in your discard. And my complaint about this game is the Racco complaint, which is you need 500 points to win. After three rounds, the higher of the two of us was at 150. It was going to take hours, like three to four hours for us to get to 500. Now, maybe this is a two player problem because you do get one point for every card that everyone else still has in their decks. Well, with only one other player, that's not a lot of cards. And one of our rounds, we were both down to two cards each. So it was like, hey, I got two points this round. That was terrible. So we actually went from like enchanted. Let's play more. This is neat. Maybe we should pick up a copy. Do I never have to play Skippo again? Yeah, and so many of these games, normal people, I, I say <laughs> with giant air quotes, don't keep score or they don't play to any sort of fixed goal. They just play. Um, yeah. You know, these aren't hobby games. These are super casual bar games or family games where scorekeeping isn't that important or important at all in some cases. Yeah, I don't know. You put him in there. I'm going to play attention to him, especially a learning game. First time playing. I don't know. I, I, it bugs me. I'm like, what do they expect? Like, like they, they expect, expect the family to sit down for six hours to play this game. Like whoever put that point total, what were they picturing? Like a seventies game night with all the grandmas smoking, all the ants smoking and playing skip bow for six hours while they chit chat. I, I don't know. Uh, next up sorcerer's arena, uh, all three expansions. This was another one of those good ones where like, the game ended 19 to 20 and it was close. Like there was an, enough, but it was one of those like both Deanna and I sat and tried to figure out if there was any way for her to get that one point. We're like, Oh, could you do this? Could you do that? What about that? What about, what if you flipped over your guy? So that was kind of cool. Yeah. This game definitely has that going for it quite often. So far we've only really had one instance where it was, yeah, okay, it was a no, this landslide. Is not, this is, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not, we're not even going to bother now. Yeah. I think that was a bad set of character combo yeah, quite on, possibly. on the one side. Uh, now, another thing I want to mention, it's gaming related, is, is we went to a trip up north a bit to another town. And after thrifting our luck in Leamington um, and finding like Marvel Legendary and like all the expansions for it, as well as a kind of cool classic game, um, we decided to hit a thrifting area in, in Chatham. And uh, don't bother is all I have to say. If if. <laughs> Uh, the 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 experience in thrifting in Chatham was not good, but there's also a local game store that's been up there for years that I know about that I haven't been to in a long time. Called the, uh, we used to be called the Game Masters Emporium, and they moved and now they're called the New Game Master Emporium, and they're in a bigger spot. I've never been to the new spot, so I'm like, we're gonna go there, and we pull out of the thrifting place, and literally across the street, I see this banner with Mario on it and says Destination Retro, but there's also a D and D ampersand in the window. And I'm like, oh, let's go check that out. So we drive over and this place was awesome. Like, I'm sure Tori and Kat know about this place because they go up to Chatham more often. Tori, uh, I think he works for a company out of Chatham, or at least his company he works for has a division up there. He's, he's driving up to Chatham a lot. Great place. Um, yes, retro video games, like tons, like, like going all the way back to Atari and ColecoVision to, to hundreds of Nintendo cartridges who you could have got the Game Boy 3D set if you wanted it. And great prices on everything I could see, like like reasonable. I would pay this much to play this retro game again. So that was cool. Um, more important to anyone listening here is the fact that they had a board game selection and a fairly solid board game selection, as well as I think it was three tables, three like three by six tables to play games and a solid amount of D&D stuff. Now, sadly, no other role playing games that did have D&D. Prices seem to match US MSRP. For the most part, which is great because they were in Canadian. So therefore a deal. And we end up buying uh, the arts and architecture expansion for tapestry there. So Deanna was like, if this will get us to play tapestry again, we'll buy it. 
It's always nice to score a deal when you can get one. And listeners can follow at Tabletop underscore deals on Twitter and at Dice.Camp to get deals all the time. Uh, so yeah, check out, if, if you're in the Chatham area, Chatham, Ontario area, check out Destination Retro. Well worth it. I couldn't tell you where it is except for the fact it's across from the major thrift store. Um, it's one of the main roads in and out of town. I couldn't tell you which one. Google it. So that was awesome. Um, and and honestly, like we'll be back next time I'm in Chatham. Anytime I'm near Chatham, I'm going to stop in there just to see what they have. Now, next was hitting the new Game Masters Emporium. Man, it's bigger. A lot more impressive. Um, place kind of felt like one of those hole in the wall dudes private little den kind of place. Now it looks like it's it's a full on comic book shop. Tons of you know the latest releases and everything, back issues and wooden wooden boxes, sorry, white cardboard boxes, uh, retro toys, other stuff like that. I could have got there's some really nice Star Wars figures. Every time I see Star Wars figures, I get tempted if they're five dollars or less. Um, ton of board games, Games Workshop stuff. So if you're into the miniature gaming, I only saw Games Workshop. And of course, nowadays, d d is everywhere. Um, great store collection of free-to-play games. Like, just take them, play them. These are ours. If you need questions, ask the owner. He'll teach you. Four big gaming tables. Like, I think these were like four by eight, so you could fit two Warhammer games on each. Owner was super friendly. Um, I wanted to support them, so we picked up a copy of Destinies from Lucky Duck Games. This is a game I've heard fantastic things about. Considered by many one of the best RPG in a box style experiences where the game's the DM kind of thing. Uh, really looking forward to checking that one out. But you know what? I'm going to save it for when we actually play it. Talk about that one. All right. Well, that's a whole bunch of uh, county gaming in essence. Yes, county gaming. Um, next is Mother's Day, which I'm going to talk about this a little, a little bit more because it, it, it was not what we expected. So I have had a box from the Mysterious Package Company. For over a year, I think, at this point, they sent me a review copy of their latest game. They wanted to build up hype. They want to get people buying it. But there was a misprinting in a, a book that's inside it, or it was missing a book. I don't even know which. To the fact that I got notified of this before I even opened the package. So I just never opened it. It just sat here. Um, we got the new version not too long ago. I think I unpackaged it on one of the shows, like held it up at least. Got it in October or November, the original. Yeah, so six months ago. So we've had it for about six months. So half a year, potentially. Um, so now it's ready. It's it's good to go. And they're looking for a review. So we brought this over to Brenda's. And that was going to be our Mother's Day gaming. So this is, uh, from my understanding, it was one of two things. It was either an escape room in a box puzzle style game, like Puzzling Pursuits. Or it was a murder mystery, solve the clues type game like uh, the hidden games crime scenes. And I didn't know which it was. Well, I opened it up and it's kind of neither. It is more of the, it's, it's the solve the mystery type. It's very much solve the mystery. Um, we haven't seen a single puzzle yet in what we've done, um, except for like deduction on which way to do something. But like no, you know, no math, no folding things, no trying to get through a maze, none of the escape room type stuff. What this ended up being is a two-part which way you literally get a novel that's, I don't know, 300 pages that you open up on page one and start reading. And that is your immersive experience telling you what you're doing as an investigator investigating this case in Victorian London. And then when you get to the end of the chapter, it's literally, do you want to go here or go here? And you flip to a different part of the book and do it. And eventually it may say, open this envelope and you get more evidence. You with it, you get like a directory with people's names and you can look those up in the books and that part of it works like the coded chronicles games so like if you see a number you can look it up in the book and like the overall thing was just like a glorified which way book which they claim is extremely immerse immersive which maybe for the one player holding the book uh that was the problem we had five of us we had me deanna her mom and both kids sitting there having and the kids fighting over who gets to read next reading chapters of books and I'm usually pretty good for listening to someone read, but these were read four pages before the decision and just totally tuned out by the end of it. And I'm falling asleep. Deanna is terrible for listening to someone read to her. That's why she doesn't sit around when I reading rule books to her. She'll just fall asleep. This just was not a five player experience. Yeah, that's tough. That's you. And I mean, so many of these games are good group experiences. 
yeah. so many of these 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 escape room in a box type of mystery games have really proven to be a great family experience. Yes. And to have this one go in the complete other direction yeah. is uh, is troubling. Now, what Deanna was saying, and I, I think I agree, is it's probably good at two because you are solving crimes and cases and putting clues together. So you probably want the two sets of eyes and the two brains, but five's just too much. It was just too much to, the, you couldn't all focus on it. Now, the bad thing about this, I don't know if it's bad, but like I went on their website, there's no player count list anywhere. There's no player time list anywhere. Um, these games, for whatever reason, even though like La Famiglia is on board Game Geek, none of the mysterious package company games are on board Game Geek. So like, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't realize that it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Now I kind of get it because the actual point of this product is you're supposed to buy it for someone else. And that's why they're called the mysterious package company is I buy Sean, a whatever this is called ghost in the machine. It shows up at his house and I don't tell him it's coming. And he gets a mysterious package that says it's from mysterious. Well, it didn't even say mysterious package. It says like detective and open this and, we need help. And you open it up and it's like, what the heck's all this stuff? And it tells you what it is. And you're like, oh, cool. I get this immersive experience. And I can totally see that being a solo thing. I gave it to Sean. Sean's going to open it up and go through the experience. I just, again, my expectations were wrong, but I fault the company for not giving me any idea what to expect in a way. Yeah. They're, they're being mysterious. And unfortunately they've been too mysterious and it has, made for the negative um sort of the, the the negative negative experience yeah so what you do get in this is two books um it says everywhere please play over multiple nights you won't finish this in one sitting take your time it stresses there's no time limit you aren't scored based on your time take as long as you want now the quality is fantastic like this is one of the most impressive Escape room boxes, whatever you want to call it, puzzle box, puzzle game, what I don't even know what to call it, murder mystery, set of clues I have seen so far. Um, these like individual evidence bags that are like stamped with the the company that you're investigating for, and an actual like the, the the directory feels like a real directory, and and then like the paper quality, the fonts, everything seemed very period. Um, there was one exception. There, there's one sheet of paper that has a coroner's report on one side and a police report on the other that are very different like backgrounds. And I don't think those two would come together in real life. And it seems odd for the expense they went to put all this other cool stuff in. Those weren't separate pieces of paper. Now, I know, Sean, you got to see some of the stuff because we let you open up the original copy that was somehow incomplete. Yeah, the the, uh, the excitement is real. This was a much better selection of paper quality, variety of, of paper components compared to some of the other ones we've looked at. It was definitely a step above. Now, the other surprise we had, besides not being for five players, is this went gross. It went gruesome. You have coroner reports. I get it. It's a coroner's report. It's meant to be uh, a, a, a detailed description of what happened to someone who passed away. But your description is of what exactly happened to people who fell into a cotton mill. Uh, in In order of what Things were damaged first without getting into too much detail because we are a family friendly show. Um, later on, your character visits the morgue to talk to the, the, the mortician, and it is in detailed description of what the, the coroner is working on and how bits of his sandwich are about to fall into open chest cavities. Um, it was just gratuitous. Um, and at least the coroner's reports were clues you needed to know. You're, you're basically trying to figure out which way the people were facing or who pushed who type of thing. I'm, I'm trying not to spoil anything here. Not that we've solved it at this point. Um, but the description of the coroner's office is just gratuitous. And then you notice an arm holding a note. Well, they drew a picture of a severed arm holding a note. And it's just at that point, it was too much for one of my kids. My one kid had to leave the room. She was so upset. Uh, my other kid kept saying, no, no, we can keep playing. But I could tell she wasn't into it. So, again, mixed expectations. Like, I, yeah, I know it's a murder mystery, but I didn't expect some of the graphic nature. And there was no real warning. And I will say this. Uh, maybe I'm generalizing here. I'm used to this from American companies. This is a Canadian company. Usually Canadian companies aren't quite as gratuitous. 
Maybe that's just my missed expectation. Just wasn't expecting it at all. Yeah, this is this is a rough one. And again, I, I get that they want to be this mysterious package. They want the experience to be strange box shows up on someone's door and you go from there. But that would almost be worse because you're, you know, it's one thing to to have the player expectations when it shows up on your door. Odds are maybe it's only going to be one person playing it. But to have someone suddenly send you that level of graphic. Yeah. You know, and, and the person sending it may not know. They may have just been deciding to send a mystery to somebody and unaware that there are graphic depictions of, you know, murdered bodies in it. <laughs> um, yeah. Trigger warnings, people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, something. I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there'll be more on the website because this doesn't even exist on their website. So I can't read the description of this. Right. Maybe the description will be a little more detailed and then we'll know. Yeah. So at this they point, dial back the, the, the mystery here. <laughs> maybe we'll see. Now, this is a finished product. This is not a prototype. So it's not like this is going to change once it's once it's released. I don't know the day it's coming out. Um, so we're holding off on our review of this one um, to be to, to what we're going to do is play it with the intended audience. So we're going to go back, um, Deanna and Brenda and I, or possibly even just Deanna and Brenda, because they enjoy. I like the puzzle games. They like the solve the murder mystery games and piecing clues together. So I might just sit back and watch, maybe snap some pictures, play on my phone or something. But because of this is going to take a bit because we're not going to do that when the kids are around because they don't want to hear it. Very fair. Uh, so I got DC Rivals Flash versus the Reverse Flash to the table with my son, and this was just as solid as the Batman versus Joker and Green Lantern versus uh, Yellow Lantern, or not, you know, whatever his name is, uh, Sinestro. Sinestro. Uh, once. Uh, and it was very much on theme. The one really nice thing about these Rivals games is they continue the theme of what those cards do in the DC deck building game into what the cards do in the versus game. So when you're playing flash in DC deck building or any of the flash related cards in DC deck building, it's very much about drawing cards. It's about getting through that deck and speeding up the deck. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what your, your hero cards in rivals are about as well. Deck cycling and deck optimization. Um, actually to the point where we actually ended by emptying the main deck rather than either of us winning through combat mm. uh, because my son was just a bit hesitant on the attack. He, he should have, he should have crushed me. Um, mm. But he, like he was, he was getting all of his points through his combos. So he did, right. but he didn't have enough when he started his hand and that, and he, so he was, he, he was worried that he wouldn't get enough, even though it was very obvious time after time, once he had played through all of the combos, he would have crushed me. Right. Uh, because he didn't have the points up front. He was hesitant, hesitant. And then I actually ended up with a clogged deck that I couldn't clean out uh, because he kept scoring most of the deck depletion, like the the, right. the deck cleaning cards. So uh, he beat me, ended up by one point because he didn't wow. actually take the advantage to to crush me the way he should have. So it was <laughs> it ended up close despite uh, him having the ability to crush me. Yeah, I've yet to try any of those rivals. That interests me way more than playing a full game of DC. Yeah, I mean rivals, and uh, you know we should we should play rivals, and we should also like with the three of us we play injustice, yeah. which is again that nice PvP. The problem with injustice is there's cards that are out on the table you have to read, which is still an issue with Deanna right now. That's true. Um, although we could you could just put the you could put the uh, the market right in front of her. It's not that big yeah. a deal. Um, Siege of Valeria. I ended up playing finally a solo game. Uh, you know. It takes up a bit more space than I would have liked. Yeah. That's the one thing I felt. It felt like it should have fit onto a TV tray and it was just a bit bigger. Like it was not a huge bit. Maybe big. if you turn the tray this way. Uh, I think my, mine are a little narrower than yours, but yeah. I think. And so it, it just, I wanted to, and I, and I ended up having to sort of rearrange how I, how I'd set up for a play, you know, and it was, it was fine. It's a, it's a fun game. Um, but I'm just. If I'm going to play solo games, I'm going to play on the computer. The same as you, you know, you're going to hit yep. PS. I'm going to, I'm going to open up steam or something. Uh, it's just a bit more management than I want for a solo experience. Uh, that being that, said, if you do like solo games, I think it's got a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, on my first time through, I didn't win, but I felt like it was possible. It, it definitely right. felt like 
oh no, okay, this is this is hard, but I, I I've got a chance, which is really what you want from a game like that. Yeah, I, my first game I lost badly, but that was because I didn't know the cards and I wasn't being good at reading ahead. I was just kind of playing it to see what would happen. And then getting to the stage where like now all the siege engines that can go, oh, okay, wait, <laughs> that's not good. I should have been paying attention to that. Yep. But like the first round, I'm like, oh, it's not in range. I'm not even going to read it. Right. I was just more focused on other things. There's some neat stuff going on in that game. Um, I, I, I like the card combos you can kind of pull off where you're like, I'm going to use this card with this to flip this die to get them not just enough to do this, to bring this into range. That part was kind of fun, but it was fiddly. Like, like there's just, there's a lot of things to track. There's a lot of cards. There's having to rearrange the board at every round was just kind of annoying. I'd slide yeah. everything up and then I had to fill some holes and then maybe slide some more things up. It, it just, I know Sean says this a lot. I don't usually feel it as much as him, but this felt like it'd be an awesome app. Like I want to play this on my phone. Yeah. I, I'm not even hundred percent sure if I'd play it on my phone. It, it's yeah, it, it was fine. And then if you yeah. like solo games, I think this is probably a good game for you. If you, if you're a Valeria yeah. fan, if you're a solo gaming fan, awesome. Um, I'm just not a solo gaming fan. So yeah. it, it, it fell a little flat for me. Now what I am curious and board game geeks, any indication, the campaign expansion adds a lot. So That'll be our next thing. I do want to get in at least one more play, and then we'll probably do a review again, probably next week, but we'll see. Um, and then we'll get that done. Then I'll break out the campaign review because I don't want to try the campaign before I've written a full review because I don't want it to impact my thoughts on the game. Well, that's it for what we've been playing. Now let's take a look at what we have coming up next. Uh, so I got some unboxings done. I read all the rule books on Monday, so I'm ready to sit down and try some new stuff. Um, this includes Illiterati. This is a cooperative real-time word game. Trick Draw, a fast-playing card game for two or more, which is not a trick-taking game, which is my biggest complaint about the game before I even try it, as you name the game Trick Draw, and it's a card game. And uh, Destinies, which I mentioned earlier. Now, the reason you should be excited about Destinies, if you haven't heard the hype, is it's Lucky Duck games, and it's the app-driven games that are based on Chronicles of Crime which the whole VR thing going on and scan things and scan people to talk to them and everything else, but a fantasy RPG feel. Um, fantasy seeming very medieval Catholic church-like, actually, from what I've seen so far. Um, miniatures totally threw me away. That uh, I don't know if Sean's seen the unboxing yet, but you see these Kickstarters with these massive amount of miniatures, and I picture these giant miniatures, but like no, they're like this big each which I was just like, oh, it's cool that there's these because now you can make it affordable. But I was just kind of shocked by how small everything was. Um, we are planning to go over to Brenda's. Um, we probably will not be doing Ghost in the Machine with, with the kids around. Um, so what I am hoping to get played there is Castle Panic. Uh, we really need, we've got the big box and all we play is the base game. We need to start diving into the aid or whatever expansion so we can get a review out on that. Um, also, this Saturday is our board game night at the Barbershop Bar. Anyone listening live that's in the area, we will be there. Uh, the event runs from 6 to 10. It's at Howard and Eugenie. It's kind of hard to miss if you know the area. Um, we will be playing games there. I plan on bringing Castle Panic. The difference is this time I'm going to set it up because that big box is scaring people. But having the tower set up with a couple orcs on the outer field, I think we'll be able to get some people in. And I think it's going to be simple enough that it will get some of the younger players to play. Because that's not a complicated game, at least with the base rules. Now, this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Roger Malash, I'm hoping to see you Saturday. Uh, hopefully we can hook you up with a shorter game this time. And I do have it from Ian that you can stay and continue to play games until close this Saturday. David Miller Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thanks to the original Patreon patron. Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss, thank you. Kat, Tori, and now Clark Domey. Hope things are going well so far. I don't miss dealing with a newborn and don't envy what you're going through right now, but he is cute. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though well, the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast.
Want to hear your name called out at the end of the show? Or more importantly, want to get some cool bonus content like copies of our show notes, bonus audio, behind-the-scenes blog posts? Please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite After Show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.